and good morning. And welcome to the 17th Annual Legislative Workshop. My name is Michael Lonergan, and I'm the Superintendent of Schools here at Longwood Central School District. And on behalf of the entire Longwood educational community, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this important annual advocacy workshop. I'd like to extend our sincere thanks for all the help and assistance that Eastern Suffolk BOCES, Suffolk Region PTA, for their ongoing support of this very, very important event. Please rise and join me as we make our pledge of allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in recognizing the Longwood Board of Education, President McGrath, Vice President Dr. Rhonda Stifum, Daniel Tomaszewski, Paul and Franco, Victoria Malloy, William Macian, Christina Brown. Also, please welcome the members of the Eastern Suffolk BOCES Board of Education. A very dear friend and colleague of mine, Vice President Mr. William Miller, a very dear friend and colleague of ours, Fred Landstaff, member and clerk, Dr. Stephen Gessner, Linda Goldsmith, Susan Lippman, and Casey, James McKenna, Catherine Romano, and John Blake. We very much appreciate the continued partnership with the Suffolk Region PTA, and I'd like to thank their regional director, Lori Fontana, for joining us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we are embarking on a budget season unprecedented in the history of education. So much that we have learned over this past year and yet so much more that we need to. The importance for all of us this morning meeting with our elected officials in helping them understand what is going to be necessary going forward in the recovery from a global pandemic within education. That's what our purpose will be this morning. And I'm so, so happy to see so many people have joined us. We're way over 250. And for a Zoom meeting, that's pretty good, which indicates the importance and your commitment to what we need to do in these next months to come. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank somebody very special to me here at Longwood, who behind the scenes each year has made these legislative events just awesome. Pam Donovan, Pam, I thank you once again for the great work that you've done in conjunction with our staff and the outstanding staff at Eastern Suffolk BOCES for this morning. So we're going to start our program today with another very close friend of mine and colleague. And we'd like to welcome back Charles S. Dedrick, Executive Director of the New York State Council of School Superintendents, and Greg Barrick, Assistant Director for Governmental Relations and assistant counsel. They'll be with us for the next few moments, sharing their thoughts as we prepare to work together. Good morning and welcome, Chuck. Making things work here, good morning. Greg, are you there? Yep, good morning. Okay, good, hi. Um, so first, let me uh, thank, uh, as he said, our good friend, Dr. Lonergan, um, and uh, the Board of Education of Longwood for inviting us back. I think this is our fourth or fifth year with you, and uh, we appreciate, uh, we always appreciate the invitation. Um, and we look forward to next year um, being with you in person. Um, that, that, is our, that is our hope and hopefully our goal. Big thank you to the uh, like I, the uh, Longwood Board of Education, the uh, Suffolk Region PTAs, and of course, our friends at Eastern Suffolk BOCES. Uh, Julie Lutz, um, the Chief, Chief Operating Officer, who will be talking in a little while, uh, David Wicks, the District Superintendent. And uh, as, um, as Michael said, uh, Pam Donovan is somebody who um, is really the link that makes all of this run and keeps us all connected. So uh, a big thank you to Pam. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to take a look at the big picture from a state perspective, and then uh, hand it off to uh, 
I believe to Julie to uh, zero more in on local. Um, Greg, do we have the slide deck? Yep, I'll load it up. Okay. Um, I need for tech, I need to enable share screening or share screen. I can talk a little bit about the. Uh, the yeah, go ahead. Okay, I can talk a little bit about the first slide while Greg uh, starts the PowerPoint. Uh, we we view we really um, have a lot of concerns about uh, this year's this year's state budget. Um, we notice we're using a uh, a picture of a shell game. Um, there are there are a lot of federal funds that are used in this year's budget. Uh, in order to balance it, and school aid isn't uh, isn't removed from that issue. Um, it, the interesting thing is how it's being done because because of the maintenance of effort uh, provisions of the federal money, uh, a lot of the a lot of the federal aid is being put toward uh, star aid, um, star reimbursement. So um, it's a new it's a new line that's been put on the state. Uh, education aid runs, and um, our concern is what it's going to look like in the out years. So right now, um, we're not sure under what cup um, these things are. Yeah, so, and, and we put this line, supplement versus the plant, an age-old question. So there's this issue where we get federal aid, and it's federal aid that was intended by the federal government can actually flow to schools, is going to be used to backfill the state budget and all our communications with the federal officials we've always emphasized the need not just for schools to get direct aid but also state and local governments so you can't reasonably expect the state to deal with its deficit while schools get a significant uh backload of money so we're hoping for both that come up in the new uh federal legislation uh that president biden has introduced a 1.9 trillion dollar bill because if it does, if it doesn't, uh, about I believe, um, and Greg helped me on this number. I think it's about twenty six percent of state spending goes to schools. So if the state spending, if if state uh, revenue is impacted severely, then the one of the few places they can turn is education aid and health aid. Yeah, and and the executive has framed this budget as a choice of, based on what the federal government does. A worst case scenario, the state gets six billion dollars in aid. A best case scenario, the state gets fifteen billion dollars in aid. There's no worst worst case scenario for what happens if we get zero dollars in aid. But considering the Biden legislation has three hundred fifty billion for state and local governments, it seems like six billion is a is a pretty reasonable, easy, easily achievable marker based on how fast Congress is moving. And we'll we'll touch base on new federal action a little bit towards the end. We wanted to show you this though because. Um, one of the things that we keep hearing when we talk uh, around the state is there is a view of Long Island that, and I love using this term, the Long Island uh, from the turn of the century is not necessarily the Long Island of today. Um, and the turn of the century that I'm talking about is the 2000, not uh, the, the previous turn of the century. Um, it, for Long Island, Long Island has actually had um, small decreases in enrollment for the most part but huge increases in um, students who um, you can see who are um, listed as uh, receiving uh, free and reduced priced meals. So um, the needs of Long Island's children has increased substantially um, in the last 20 years. Um, the, the, um, the enrollment has not, but when you start hearing about arguments about um, well, enrollment's going down, uh, therefore school budget should be going down. Uh, all you have to do is point to the needs of the children that Long Island school districts are now educating. The, the needs of those children have increased more than any other area in the state on a percentage basis. Yep. Thanks, Chuck. So general big picture on state budget, and we'll try to break this down as into the least complicated way possible with the limited amount of time, not sure how in depth we can get. But overall, a 
total uh, increase in funding proposed. There's no increase in foundation aid and there's substantial cuts to expense-based aids, but the 7.1% increase is driven by a $2.72 billion increase in federal support with the state using about a billion dollars of that federal money to offset other parts of the state budget. 3.8 billion was what came through the, um, the federal December stimulus legislation, <clears throat> excuse me. There's also the CARES Act COVID uh, pandemic adjustment. Last year that was introduced uh, about a billion dollars statewide, which is the amount of money we got through the CARES Act. Some people treat it as a cut, but in, in the end, the executive had proposed a billion dollar increase in school aid and just, it was never enacted because COVID hit, um, schools closed obviously mid-March, two weeks before the end of the budget and cycle. It was obvious that the, the state revenues would be in the dump. But now that pandemic adjustment maintains with no offsetting CARES, CARES Act funds, so that's part of the cut that's in there. Um, state funding this year includes STAR. Some, some policy makers would always consider STAR as part of school aid. The reality is if, you, if STAR went away, schools would have trouble increasing their levy because STAR keeps your overall property taxes down. So you can go back and forth on that argument. The reason the executive, in our opinion, adds STAR to the school aid run is to address, address this maintenance of effort provision that basically tells states that if you take our federal dollars, you have to maintain a certain level of effort for school aid. Uh, and there's a complicated formula under both the CARES Act and the stimulus legislation. Then there's this $1.35 billion local funding adjustment that's taken against STAR. Um, so the question, Chuck alluded to it earlier, what does that mean for the out years? Not necessarily this year. Foundation aid frozen for a second straight year. 11 aids would be consolidated into services aid. The two categories we're most concerned about there are BOCES aid and transportation aid. Some of the other aid categories have been frozen already for a number of years, like public high, uh, or high tax aid, excuse me. Um, these, are these are proposals that I think the governor's made at least, this is at least a third straight year and possibly fourth where he's tried to consolidate different aid categories and freeze different expense-based aids. They've been rejected by the legislature and haven't gotten a lot of traction. I would expect the same this year. It's just a question of how do we still pay for all of the funds of the entire state budget without a significant influx of uh, state and local government assistance. The, the thing is with services aid though, uh, services aid is one of the more predictable aid categories that there is. It allows for superintendents and business officials and boards of education to actually plan purchases and try to do things on a regional basis through BOCES and, it, and actually know what you will receive in aid in out years because of that. Uh, this consolidation of the aids totally takes that away. Um, it totally makes the entire um, revenue side of the budget um, from year to year guesswork, essentially. Yeah, and th that's the key. Predictability, predictability, predictability. Foundation aid isn't predictable. You don't know what you're getting year to year, but you knew the expense-based aid side. So you could have some planning ability. This wipes out the entire ability to have any predictability within school aid. Uh, prior adjustment queues limit, that's a $300 million queue that school districts are owed with an $18 million annual appropriation and very minimal policy in this budget as there has been in the last few budgets. And like I always say, Greg, um, that means that schools that are in the queue to get money that they're owed won't get that money, but the state will keep taking money from schools if they deem schools to owe it, correct? Yes, through the prior year adjustment. Okay. Yep, thanks, Chuck. Um, so this is the, while the state total funding increase is 7.1% as an average, the median is far below that. New York City is actually getting a 13% increase, so that skews the overall percent upwards. Here's a breakdown of the number of districts statewide that were within these uh, 10 categories of percent increase or decrease, as well as uh, the breakdown for Long Island. And even with the federal aid, you still see 23% of districts statewide with a decrease. And it looks like from the Long Island side, um, over around 35% from click glance goes negative. And that, but that's usually driven by expense-based aids. The cut, the local funding adjustment referenced earlier is imposed against STAR and it equals the lesser of the district's stimulus payment or their STAR payments. Originally when the December act came out, the assumption would be because it was about four times as much as the CARES Act that each district would get four times their CARES Act um, adjustment. It didn't turn out that way. And there's some districts that see 20 times as much and some that see only two and a half times as much. So we're still trying to work through the rationale on why that was the case in some districts and not others. Um, but regardless, we're still looking at more federal aid coming through, at least the way the politics are looking at the moment. 
This is a document that uh, our colleague, uh, the one and only Bob Lowry, developed. So this year we call it an easier to read school aid run. It's supposed to be an easier to read school aid run because nothing about this budget is easy. So we modified it to easier. Um, this specific slide breaks down. So one of the reasons it's easier to read is it puts the school aid numbers side by side as opposed to vertical. So you can crosswalk at a different manner. You'll see this breaks out the services aid, those 11 formulas into what their traditional expense-based aid categories are. One thing you may note is a 13.9% increase in transportation aid. We don't think that's particularly accurate because the 2020-21 numbers are probably way lower than they should have been because people weren't actually asserting claims for delivery of school meals and instructional materials and Wi-Fi connectivity because the, that wasn't aidable under current law. The executive proposed this to make that aidable, at least for the 1920 school year, but we think that increase is not realistic. It's probably a lot less once everything is accounted for. It is important to note that nobody, and I mean no one, benefits from transferring to services aid. Um, there's a pure, pure people cut attributed to it that we'll go to next, but not a single district actually benefits from this transition. You can check on your district's aid though in this easier to use aid run by going to niscus.org and you can actually plug in your district and see what the numbers are. Yes, thanks for that, Chuck. And uh, you, you just put in your BEDS code and you can pull it up. We think it's a nice advocacy document as well as something just to inform you as you analyze the budget's implication on your district. This shows the how the cut is given uh, per, dish, per pupil for expense-based aids. Aver statewide average is $268 per student, but the majority of the cuts fall to New York City. So while New York City has a 13% overall increase, if this expense-based aid cut is eliminated, New York City's share of the aid or the increase will go substantially up. We're not sure how much shares is in impact this year because foundation aid is frozen. Shares is in the total school aid increase that goes to Long Island, New York City, and the rest of the state. Something we think needs to go away, not because we think Long Island needs more or less aid, but you can't actually get to a working formula that provides for student need while shares exist uh, as just a, you have to work backwards to get to the overall school aid number as long as shares are in play. The federal level, so uh, President Biden said $1.9 trillion proposal. He seems to be willing to use reconciliation to get that. Reconciliation is a process that you need just 50 votes in the Senate as opposed to the filibuster to approve 60, which the Senate Democrats obviously are not gonna get considering it's a 50-50 Senate with Vice President Harris uh, breaking the tie. There was just a recap in, uh, in March or April of, of 2020 with the CARES Act that provided $13.5 billion to schools. Then in December, we had a, another stimulus bill that provided $54 billion to school. And then the Biden Act that provided $130 billion. So we're looking at substantial amounts of money. I have all reason to believe that that will happen by the end of February. That's what Speaker Pelosi said. That seems to be the plan. I don't know what percent of the $350 billion New York will get for state and local government, but as the governor said, if we get 15 billion, he'll wipe out a lot of his cuts. Now, if we get 8 billion, I don't think that means 2 billion more for schools instead of the $6 billion minimum. It may mean restoration of the middle-class tax cuts, then elimination of the, of the tax on the wealthy. There will be other priorities before we get to 15 billion that I think the executive is more keen on focusing current, on. Current federal money, Greg, um, is. Uh, according to the federal rules, they're allowing schools to use it over the course of three years. But the state, New York, is using it all, the current money, in this one fiscal year, which is of big concern to us. What happens in the out years? Yeah, but Chuck alluded to that earlier as well. The, the future years are the concern, this fiscal cliff, and whether this local district funding adjustment becomes a GEA 2.0. Those are real concerns. To, to mitigate that, one of the things we're asking the legislature for is an increase in the unrestricted fund balance to 8% for the next five years. Now you could say we, need, we want longer than five years. If we get it for five years, we can deal with the next five years after that. And that will help schools properly manage this influx of federal aid, especially if we get at least nationally another $130 billion. Schools can plan to use it over a period of three years and they can move it around how they see fit, but you need some flexibility in how you deal with reserves to actually properly budget for it. Because while local governments have no limit on unrestricted funds, fund balance, schools are capped at a pretty unreasonable 4%. And finally, uh, SALT, something that's near and dear to the hearts of, of residents in Nassau and Suffolk County, as well as counties just north of the city, Westchester, Rockland. Um, 
has a chance this year. I, I'm not sure what chance it has, because while the Democrats have control of the Senate, and it matters a lot to those Democratic senators in New York and California and other high tax states in Connecticut, the Georgia senators that gave control of the Senate to the Democrats may not be that interesting because it may, may not be that much of a benefit to them. And it's very expensive and tends to be geared towards wealthier taxpayers. Nevertheless, I'd say it's a decent shot we get at least a partial restoration, maybe not a full restoration as we may like. But Congressman Mondaire Jones, a new, new Democrat from uh, Westchester, Rockland, which is the two highest tax counties in the state, has introduced legislation to fully reinstate it. This is the state and local tax deduction on your income tax. It was capped a few years ago at $10,000. And um, right now uh, we are hearing from uh, our national affiliate that it is something that's being talked about and a New York representative um, has introduced it. And I believe that uh, Senator Schumer is also has also talked positively about that. I believe uh, Congressman Swazi from uh, Nassau was, is also a uh, sponsor of the legislation. There may be a couple other Long Island congressmen and women that are on this bill. So, so let me let me say this. Um, I, I I was a school superintendent for twenty years in three different places. I have been uh, the executive director at the New York State Council of School Superintendents for five years, and before that, I was a principal. So, I've dealt with state budgets for close to close to thirty years, and thought that I had a pretty good grip on them and a good understanding of what they were. Um, this year is one of the most um, confusing, elusive budgets to fully get um, our arms around. And speaking strictly for myself, um, this, is, this is a really difficult budget. And I go back to that first slide that we used of those cups being moved around. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly what some of this means. We're trying to figure out what the long-term implications are, but please, please do not be fooled by seeing somewhere where it says a 7% increase in aid because it is, it is somewhat sleight of hand. It is infusing money uh, for one year and we're concerned that there's going to be a, a pretty steep cliff at the end of it. So um, superintendents and business officials and boards around the state, um, we're, we're talking to as many as possible and um, asking for as much caution as possible. Yes, the um, we did a presentation for the legislature and we had a number of state senator and assembly members on the call. And one of them was saying, why does this budget make no sense? And another New York City senator chimed in and goes, well, it's the executive's goal to make such a confusing budget that it's harder to advocate against. So our job is to try to break it down into the simplest terms possible to empower you and your schools to, to better counter the negative effects of the budget. And uh, seek a stronger budget from your legislators. So the takeaway from this one is uh, infusion of federal money um, that is holding down any increases for this year and um, the shared services aid, which is being, which is being um, bundled with other things and taken away. So beware this year. But I, I'm, I want to thank you again. Um, thank you to Dr. Lonergan for having us and um, to Eastern Suffolk BOCES for inviting us. Uh, the slides will be available, but um, and this is recorded, but I encourage you all um, to uh, look at our website. We have a lot of advocacy stuff. And during the COVID, um, <laughs> during our COVID experience, we've opened up everything to everyone. So please take a look at what's there. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck, Greg, as always, um, the information that you present to us at this time of year uh, is our guiding light into the next few months of advocacy. You were spot on, both of you today, in your analysis of what we know so far, and most importantly, uh, the anticipation of what we don't know at this point in time. At Longwood, when we make our annual trek to Albany each year with our students and with our community members, we're always faced with the same um, impression from legislators and that is, listen guys, we know that you're here and we know that you're looking for more money. 
And we always try to make the point that, yes, the funding about education is extremely important, but there are other aspects of how education is funded in New York State that we are here to talk to you about to best educate you so you can advocate for us. And they were covered by Greg and by Chuck in the last few moments. The importance of understanding set aside funding, the importance of what the future will look like and how we need to be able to plan from year to year with certain realistic expectations. Your work, our work together going forward this year and in the future is extremely important to be sure that we are providing our communities and our elected officials with the facts of what is necessary to take care of our children in the years to come. So with that, I'd like to now uh, introduce another good friend of mine and colleague who worked very hard to make this morning happen. And uh, she's here for the next few moments uh, to talk a little bit more specifically about Long Island and the good work that um, we do together. So with that, uh, Dr. Julie Lutz, Chief Operating Officer at East Pacific OCs, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Lonigan. Um, quite an interesting Longwood legislative event we're having this year. Um, thank you also to our tech support. So let me see now. I can share the screen and you can see what I see. Try again, share. Are you able to see that or no? Yes. Okay. Um, So the nice thing is I can actually see the presentation. Typically when I'm speaking of this presentation, I am, it is behind me. Um, so uh, Long, Long Island schools in the midst of a pandemic. Every year I do a little bit of thinking about what's gonna be a good topic for this presentation. Um, who ever thought a year ago that we would be still here a year later, um, but we are, and it has definitely impacted um, not only how we do school, but how we fund school. So this morning, I'm just gonna talk uh, about five really key things. One is the demographic shifts, and I'm so thankful to Chuck and Greg for speaking about that a little bit. Uh, I will dive a little bit more into those facts, um, something that is weighing on the minds of all of us which is the social emotional health of our students. It has been a focus of this presentation for the last several years, but certainly COVID-19 has, has exacerbated that beyond, I think, what any of us really realize at this point. Um, our student outcomes, uh, the fiscal stressors that we are dealing with, not only because of COVID, but um, because of school funding in general, and then our ask for COVID uh, flexibility. Uh, so Long Island, shifting demographics, which of course means shifting needs. And again, Chuck spoke a little bit about free and reduced price lunch numbers, but let's take a look at some other things, right? So as we know, New York State in general has been um, losing um, population, right? And that um, is the case for Suffolk County. Um, I will say this is, this is a Long Island presentation. So you're gonna see a little bit of Suffolk and a little bit of Nassau because we've always advocated as an island. And I think it's important for us to know where we sit in the midst of that. Um, but this is all of the Suffolk County school districts. And I know um, it might be small, but this presentation also will be shared. And then you will actually be able to go in and see your district if you can't see it on your present screen. But overall, Suffolk County in the last uh, 10 years has seen a 10% decrease in enrollment. Um, that is actually at this point comparable with the rest of the state. That has not been the case in the you know, last several years. Suffolk County's shift in enrollment has not been the same as the other state. But what you see way over to the left is that there are districts that have seen huge changes in enrollment um, increases. Um, and then of course, over to the right, all of the districts that have seen a decrease in enrollment. Uh, these are Nassau districts, similar pattern. Uh, Nassau's percentage change is much lower, 3.4% decrease in enrollment in Nassau County schools in the last 10 years. 
Um, but this is a little bit of a deeper dive into free and reduced price lunch numbers or economically disadvantaged students. Um, so this is basically students and families, right? And, and how the change, uh, the change that we've seen in the last 10 years in the um, economic status of families, the green line there is Suffolk County. Um, so as you can see, a steady increase in the number of families in Suffolk County that have qualified for re free and reduced price lunch numbers. And I really, I just need to point out the qualification um, levels for free and reduced price lunch numbers are not adjusted um, by need, right? So, you know, if you qualify for free and reduced price lunch on Long Island, um, that means that your family um, is probably struggling even more than maybe if, if you were making that same amount of money in another part of the state where the cost of living may not be so high. The red number is Nassau County, again, ready, uh, you know, steady increase, um, but numbers lower than in Suffolk County because Suffolk County um, is seeing increase in poverty at a different level than Nassau County. Um, this is actually a chart that takes a look at the change, and that is really important, which is why we put that word in red. Uh, so this is the 10 year change in free and reduced price lunch numbers. And although you cannot see the districts way over to the right, what you will see is every district in Suffolk County. Um, the only one that doesn't show up as a change is Little Flower and their circumstances are quite unusual uh, because it's a special act uh, school. Um, but every district in Suffolk County, every single one has seen an increase in the number of students that qualify for free and reduced price lunch. Um, Suffolk County as a whole is 67.9% increase in the last um, 10 years, uh, Long Island um, as a whole 72.7%. So um, a large number of families with uh, greater struggles economically than they used to. Um, and this are the Nassau numbers and might be a surprise to people, but again, huge numbers, 81.1% of the students, 81.1%, um, excuse me, increase in students in Nassau County in the last 10 years who qualify for free and reduced price lunch. For those of you who like to see that in a, a different type of visual um, illustration, this is a map. This is the 0910 map of Suffolk County schools. Uh, just to help you understand that, the bright blue um, are where you have free and reduced price lunch numbers of between zero and 25%. Green, uh, the lighter green is between 26% and 50%, and the red is 76% to 100%. So that's what it looked like in 09010. This is what it looks like now. So many more districts um, in darker green or in lighter green, and, and now at this point, five districts where 76 to 100% of the students in that district qualify for free and reduced price uh, lunches. Uh, these are the Nassau numbers. I won't go into them in great detail, but you can also see this is 0910, um, and this is in 1920. So the same uh, type of pattern happening in Nassau schools. So a key fact, according to federal guidelines, over 38% of the students enrolled in Long Island school districts qualify as economically disadvantaged. Um, again, that would be a surprise to many people who don't pay attention to these numbers and certainly surprise to most people in the state and in Albany that are that see Long Island as traditionally what Long Island has been thought of, which is um, an island that uh, financially or economically is um, pretty solid. Um, so let's take a look at our English language learner numbers. Um, Chuck and Greg spoke about this a little bit as well. So these are New York State demographics, right? Top English language learner districts. That means um, by number, top by number. You will see of the top districts in the state, four of them are on Long Island. So, um, and granted, New York City, is, you know, certainly has the highest number of English language learners, but Brentwood, Hempstead, Central Islip, and Riverhead um, fall within the top districts across the state for number of English language learners. Um, we also take a look, so very often you see English language learners combined um, with some economic struggles in a district. So these are New York State school districts where English language learner enrollment is 20% or more. Um, and again, all of the red ones are districts that fall on Long Island. And what you see when you put free and reduced price lunch percentages next to those numbers, you have districts that are not only 
um, needing to put things into place to, you know, make sure their English language learners have the education that they need, but they're also districts where families are, are struggling economically um, because of the free, you know, free and reduced, excuse me, free and reduced price lunch percentages quite high in those districts. Um, this is just a graph that shows the progression of, of English language learner students on Long Island. Again, the green line is Suffolk County. Um, the red line, excuse me, the blue line is Long Island, Long Island as a whole, and the red line is Nassau County. But the purple line that we've added on the bottom is the rest, the rest of the state percentage of English language learners. So again, um, it just illustrates the shifts in Long Island demographics. This is something we started messaging five or six years ago. Um, you know that that you know the student need on Long Island has has shifted um, tremendously. Um, this is the change English language learner change uh, spread out over districts. So you can see there, although there's 63.6 percent change in Suffolk County in the last 10 years, and you can see many many of the districts um, in Suffolk County are seeing that increase. Some obviously more than others. Um, this is what it looks like in, in Nassau County, similar pattern, um, slightly different numbers. Long Island had 39,001 English language learners in October of 2020 when we took a, um, took a grab, you know, look at that data. This is 18% of the state's total English language learner population, including New York City. Um, and we also take a look at our numbers of students with disabilities, right? So we are seeing an increase in students with disabilities across Long Island, Suffolk County has had an 8.8% increase in those numbers in the, in the last 10 years. Um, Long Island as a whole, 9.5%. And when you wonder what does that look like, you know, compared to the rest of the state, so the rest of the state um, has only seen a 5.3% increase. It's not, you know, it's really not unusual to expect that when you have increases in poverty and when you have um, increases in, in folks who are English language learners, not that being an English language learner makes you a student with a disability, but, you know, sometimes students who've come from other countries have not uh, maybe not had the same level of education, maybe they've had different medical needs. Um, so when you go through the process of determining that, yes, indeed, they also have a disability, we see um, increases in numbers. Um, this is Nassau County seeing the same thing, increasing numbers in the numbers of students with disabilities. So the other thing when we, we look at, you know, we've talked about family wealth um, a number of times, but let's also look at um, district wealth and district wealth is driven by two things is driven by, you know, the, the um, wealth of the region or, you know, but it's, it's also driven by the um, income of, of the residents in a school district. So in 2010-11, this is what um, districts look like in Suffolk County, uh, based on combined wealth ratio. So just to kind of generally understand combined wealth ratio, if you are below 1.00, which is the red districts there, it means you fall below the statewide average, right? So all of those districts in 2010-11 had a combined wealth ratio of below 1.00, which is below the statewide average. Um, the dark green is between 1.0 and 1.499, and then light green is higher and combined wealth ratio over two are the bright blue numbers. And you can see, when you're able to look at this on your screen next to each district, we have the actual combined wealth ratio if you wanna see uh, where your particular district falls specifically. Um, oops, wait a minute. And this is what it looks like now. So not um, surprisingly, we have many more districts that are falling below the statewide average in combined wealth. So what that tells us is not only do we have families that are seeing more poverty, but as districts, um, we are falling into categories of more need than we have been. Uh, same pattern in Nassau County, this is 2010-11, and this is what it looks like now. So if you wanna look at the numbers, um, the number of students in Suffolk County that are being educated in districts with below average wealth, 146, 707 
thousand or 63.9 percent of the students in this in this county are educated in districts of below average wealth so i mean that is something i think again will be surprised to our elected officials i think maybe in, in particular the newly elected officials uh, many of the of the students in this county in fact uh, the majority of these students in this county are educated in districts of below average wealth um, so let's take a look at homelessness, right? People don't necessarily think of students being homeless on Long Island unless you work in education and, and you know, run into that on a regular basis. According to New York State Ed data, uh, 7,669 students enrolled in Long Island schools um, experienced homelessness in New York State at any point um, during the school year. This is 1920 data. Um, that's 1.8%. Now it's not as high um, as the statewide average, which is really driven up by the homelessness in, in uh, New York City and other cities across the state. Um, but it is still um, a high percentage uh, for Long Island, and I think particularly the um, the reputation that Long Island has. Uh, let's take a look at what that looks like across specific districts. Um, these are the top homeless districts by number across the state. And three of those are on Long Island, Hempstead, William Floyd, and Brentwood. Two of those, of course, in Suffolk County. Long Island had 7,669 students experience homelessness um, in 2019-20. Um, now that is 5.9% of the state's total homeless number. And that is including New York City. Um, this is just a, a a line graph to show the same thing. Um, rest of state, again, those numbers are driven up by, by New York City, but you can see um, that progression. The blue line is Long Island. The green line is Suffolk County slowly going up. Um, and we've seen actually from 1819 to 1920, a slight dip in those numbers. This is the change. So this is what's happened in the last 10 years for homeless numbers. Um, across Long Island, 47.7% increase in Suffolk County, 133% uh, increase in Nassau County, much of that driven um, by uh, a couple of, of specific districts. Hempstead is the one furthest over, over to the left, followed by Roosevelt and Freeport. So let's just quickly talk about facts related to student social emotional health. Um, we all have been watching this for the last 11 months and probably wondering exactly what are the long term impacts, some of what our students have been living through. Um, changes in their routines, having to physically distance from family, friends, worship communities, breaks in continuity of learning, you know, virtual learning environments, technology access, connectivity issues, and breaks in continuity of healthcare, you know, missing well child visits, immunization visits, limited access to things like uh, mental health support, speech and occupational health services, miss significant life events and you know living in a pandemic it's easy to say you know it was only this party it was only this birthday it was only this prom um, but there is grief associated with missing those kinds of celebrations missing the traditional vacations um, or other you know family events that um, bring families and and young people joy um, as well as other mi uh, milestone life events and certainly this loss of security and safety, some of that perceived and some of that real, you know, increased housing and food ins insecurity, as well as um, increased exposure to violence and online harms. Um, certainly domestic violence numbers um, have been up in this, in this time as well. Um, what is the impact of COVID-19 on education? The ability to learn declines, disrupted school-based services, immunizations, meals, mental health support therapies, regression from developmental milestones, increased risk of teen pregnancy, sexual exploitation, violence, um, and harms are greater for children with disabilities. And I know districts have, have tried really hard to make sure um, to provide for their students with disabilities in this time. Long-term impacts, school dropout rates increase, decreased in highest education levels achieved because of things like school dropout and uh, loss of motivation, reduction in lifelong earnings, long-time impact, exacerbation of existing achievement gaps across race, gender, and disability. 
Um, this is a study done by Cohen's Children Medical Center in South Oaks Hospital, um, an attempt to um, quantify what projected uh, learning loss might be in math and, and performance. So just an example, something that won't be a surprise to any educator. Um, rates of psychiatric illness in children in the USA, right? This country is, is living through a pandemic. Um, and we have students who had struggles before we even got here, right? ADHD diagnosis, 9.4% um, in June of 2020, but these are in students ages two to 17, behavior problems, 7.4%, which, you know, these are millions of students, right? It doesn't sound like a large percentage, but certainly millions of students, anxiety disorder, depression diagnosis, and we know all of those things have been exacerbated in this pandemic. Um, this is October 29, 2020 data, National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Prior to the pandemic, it was estimated that 13.2% of adolescents received some form of mental health services in the school setting. In the preceding 12 months um, of students receiving mental health services, 57% of those received a portion of their treatment at school. So just another example of what, you know, this, um, lack of continuity of, of students being in, in a school environment has been, you know, will be impacted by 35% receive all of their mental health services in school. Um, and this interesting data, right, this is an evolving situation, so the data is limited, but just one study done, a sample group of 2,330 school children presented signs of emotional distress um, this was actually in China, after being locked down for an average of 33.7 days. 33.7 days, a little over a month, 22.6% reported depressive sy uh, symptoms, and just under 19% were experiencing anxiety. And again, we've seen that in our students, we've seen that um, in our, our colleagues as well. Um, this is a graph, weekly number of emergency department uh, pediatric mental health related visits. Um, this is, is national data, you can see in the bottom graph, um, you know, the, the line on the top, the dotted line is 2020 data compared to 2019 data. So you can see an increase in those numbers. Um, we've taken a look at, at suicide mortality in the last couple of years as well. Um, males more successful than females, but you can see an increase, right, in the last 10 or 11 years in suicide mortality. Um, Suicide second largest cause of death in youth and young adults across this country. Um, drug overdose deaths, um, the, the blue number, the blue bar in the top graph are females, the orange bar are males. Um, and again, you can see that has been inching up, inching up as well. That is from the National um, Health, uh, National Vital Statistics System drug overdose deaths, um, and you can see the ages, right? Zero to 14, 15 to 24. Um, you know, there's many more in, in individuals who are older, but you can see even in students that young, a drug overdose uh, deaths. And this county actually was doing some good work, has been doing good work in, in keeping overdose deaths down. Um, and we certainly have seen in the last 11 months, those numbers go up. Um, if you take a look at New York State, Nassau and Suffolk County are up there with the, um, the counties showing the highest number of deaths involving drugs. Those were 2019 numbers, so that was pre-pandemic. Um, and this actually is from last year, but important data, right? In 2019, when uh, superintendents across the state were surveyed, 67% of them said if they had more money, they would put it toward providing mental health services for their students. So superintendents definitely seeing um, the deed here. So let me just quick take a look at student outcomes. We don't have all of the assessment outcomes from last year because uh, the vast majority of state assessments, actually none of the state assessments happened in this state, but we do have, have graduation outcomes, right? So this is, um, this is graduation outcomes from 2020. Um, Suffolk County is um, in the red, right, is um, the red columns. 90.3% of the students in this county graduated in 2020 um, compared to the rest of the state at 87.5% um, and New York State at 88.7%. So Suffolk County still 
doing well with graduating students, um, uh, with, certainly with advanced regents diplomas and, and regents diplomas. We pride ourselves on you know, helping students get over the uh, finish line. And then we break things out by wealth though. So here the red, the red um, columns are least wealthy districts in Suffolk County compared to wealthy districts, right? And when you, when you separate out our districts with high needs versus um, our districts with low needs, you see that there is a discrepancy in our ability to meet the needs of those students. Graduation rate 81.7% in our least wealthy districts and 91.7% in our wealthy districts. This is what it looks like in a bar graph. Um, for those of you who, who like a visual, so we do a good job of, of graduating students, but um, definitely differences uh, when you take a look at the needs of the students, the needs of, of the districts. So this island, you know, the schools on this island do an amazing job of providing robust educational programs for students. It's been difficult to do that in a pandemic, but um, we're still having success there. Um, still, you know, had students in the Regenerate Science Talent Search, um, and Long Island still outperforms really most of the nation in this type of work. If we were a state, we would rank second in the number of 2021 Regeneron STS semi-finalists. There were 40 across Long Island. Um, um, and we would only come in second between the rest of New York and California. California as an entire state had 38, New York State. Um, had 97, but 40 of those 97 were on Long Island. So really exceptional um, success there. 13.3% of all of the semifinalists semi uh, countrywide uh, came from Long Island. Uh, and two of the 40 high school seniors named um, finalists on 2021 from Long Island, uh, Justin from Jericho and Lucy from uh, the Wheatley School in Old Westbury. Um, still had schools doing amazing work, becoming Blue Ribbon schools. In 2020, three uh, Long Island high schools were awarded, Plainview Old Bethpage High School, Wantaw Senior High School, and right here in Suffolk County, West Islip Senior High School. So congratulations to those schools and districts for doing that work. Um, really appreciative of um, this data. Uh, Long Island districts have prided themselves on the ability to provide, again, you know, robust um, art and music programs for their students. And this is just um, some data about the numbers of students that took part and the number of districts that were represented. And again, this is 2021 data. So people really were doing a heavy lift to make sure students could get that, um, could get those experiences. So um, let's take a look at, at the impact of COVID, right? In October, we surveyed schools, uh, school districts across Long Island to say what exactly has been the impact of COVID-19 um, COVID on, on your budgets. And at that point, over 5,000 new positions were added. Um, some of those were teachers to, you know, be able to help districts cohort and provide what they needed. Some of those were aides and assistants. Some of those were things like extra custodial staff, extra nursing staff. Um, and many of those positions were brought on in low wealth districts. So again, we see that disproportionate impact on districts of low wealth. Um, 105.5 million additional dollars in COVID-19 expenses. And I have to say, um, our response rate for that survey was about 50%. So about half of the districts on Long Island were able to respond. So that number is likely considerably higher than 105 million. This is how it really kind of broke out. Um, the blue is staffing additions. Uh, the gray there is technology. We know people needed to add technology. And um, the bright uh, golden there is PPE supply. So lots of different places districts required to um, spend money to be able to keep their students safe. What are our budgeting challenges as I wrap up here? Certainly COVID-19 costs, a tax levy cap that desperately needs modifications, a foundation formula freezes uh, for the last two years, unreliable aid, making it difficult to plan ahead, um, and certainly disproportionate aid coming to Long Island. Um, we've seen that for a long time. Uh, we've been living under a tax levy cap since 2012 uh, when it um, was put into law. 
Um, this year, we've been notified the tax levy cap is 1.23%. Certainly, many more years, it was below 2% than it was uh, 2%, which is the maximum. Um, the state budget looking back. So when we take a look at the last um, 10 years of state budget, um, you see, and this state has, has been amazing to school districts, right? You know, they put a lot of money into their school districts, but for 2021, um, the red line there is all else, everywhere else that the state budget is going. And we know there's lots of places the state needs to be spending money. Um, the blue line there is school aid. So you certainly see uh, the challenges that we have. Um, as for many, many years, what we've seen is that we get 12% of the aid um, while we have 16% of the students and certainly students with increasing needs. Um, this is a great chart. It really accentuates not only that, but it accentuates the fact that on Long Island compared to other places in the state, much more of the money to fund schools comes from our taxpayers, right? So property tax and other revenues on Long Island pays almost 67% of what it takes to keep our schools running, whereas the rest of the state, it's 47.4%. So much more of the money to fund school districts comes from taxpayers um, instead of from, from um, the state um, in Long Island schools. And, you know, we all know because we all live here, um, funding, uh, you know, paying our school taxes is a challenge. Um, and that's really because much more of, of that comes out of our own pockets. Um, this is what it looks like on Long Island compared to the rest of the state. You can see on the left, 66.7%. Those are, um, that's what's coming from out of our pockets where in the rest of the state, it is um, certainly less than 50% of funding. Um, this is just a look at how that breaks out compared to least wealthy versus wealthy districts. Um, you can see in least wealthy districts, there's more of a disproportionate um, impact. Um, and that's just a different way of looking at that. So what are we asking for as I wrap up? Increased flexibility, you know, so, so supportive um, and appreciative of our elected officials that have allowed districts to borrow from fund balances um, and reserves. We would just ask for additional flexibility, certainly in this year um, and maybe the next couple of years um, and, and how we do that and the amount we can borrow. APPR adjustments, um, you know, we pride ourselves on, on providing good education here, but it's very difficult to meet all of those requirements living and, and, you know, working in a pandemic. Amending the Wix law, it costs districts unnecessarily amounts of money. Authorizing transportation aid for all that people have used school buses to do, which is far more than transporting students. Um, taking a look at the underlying drivers in special education that are pushing up the cost of special ed services way beyond providing the services that districts need. Um, some flexibility in part 154, which is the, the regulations that identify how we need to educate our English language learners. Um, and finally, establishing an education mandate relief redesign team to review ways to reduce the cost. We know it's a difficult time to do that kind of work, but it is critical work to be done. Um, that nobody is going to argue that the tax levy cap has not done nice things for taxpayers in this country, but if, or excuse me, in this state. But if there's ever a year to provide some modifications, it would be this year. Uh, establishing it as a fixed 2% tax levy, excluding the expenses that districts have had to spend for things like safety, COVID-19, security, exempting the cost of new, ban uh, new mandates, um, exempting the costs of, of ever burgeoning health insurance. Um, and again, making sure that districts are not um, negatively impacted by negative tax levy caps and pilot uh, issues. Uh, so thankful for the people who are here, the elected officials, the people taking time on a Saturday morning to learn. Um, and we're just thankful and appreciative of the expectation of ongoing collaboration with our legislators a recognition on the part of all about the changing needs on Long Island, um, exclusions to the tax cap for the things that I just spoke about and some COVID-19 flexibility. Again, thank you for all that you do. And now I will turn it back over. Thank you, Julie. I know that um, 
I speak for every school superintendent that works with you and Dave and your staff at BOCES uh, when I say thank you for the information that you provide us on a daily, weekly basis going back many years. Uh, we are all better superintendents and better people for the work that we have done together and for your guidance throughout the time we've been together. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank um, my colleagues around Suffolk County who have worked so hard with you over this past year and before. Um, their exemplary leadership in this pandemic has been um, second to none. And I'm very proud to have been able to serve with you and with them during this very difficult time. The remaining portion of our morning together uh, is going to be spent uh, doing what we do best, and that's advocating for what we believe is important to take care of our staff and students uh, going forward. <clears throat> I've been very uh, fortunate to work with uh, two young ladies who are going to lead you through the rest of our morning, and they are members of our legislative uh, committee here at Longwood, and uh, that is our um, Vice President of the Board of Education, Dr. Rhonda Statham, and another young lady by the name of Victoria Malloy, um, who will be introducing our legislators and introducing our talented and gifted students uh, who participate in this process each year. So with that, ladies, um, the stage is yours and um, go do it and make us proud as you usually do. Thank you, Dr. Lonigan. Good morning, everyone. We would like to extend our thanks to the dedicated members of our legislative committee for their advocacy and hard work throughout the year, especially our students. After serving the educational community for 43 years and the Longwood School District for 19 years as a central office administrator, deputy superintendent and superintendent of schools, Dr. Lonergan will retire this June. He has moderate, moderated this event for nine years and has been a tremendous advocate for public education throughout his tenure. He and his administrative team have consistently brought to the Longwood community a school budget that includes the necessary academic and social emotional programs that have led the way in both the state and the country. On behalf of the Longwood Board of Education, past and present, as well as the entire school community, we extend our sincere thanks for his tireless support of our students and staff. Okay, so let's bring our legislators into the panel if we can. And we ask that our assembly members and our senators share time among colleagues. Adhering to this format will foster a discussion of the widest range of topics and perspectives. Please welcome to the panel, Senator Phil Boyle, Senator Mario Matera, Senator Anthony Palumbo, Senator Alexis Weick, Assemblyman Joseph DiStefano, Assemblyman Steve Engelbright, Assemblywoman Jody Giglio, Assemblyman Doug Smith, and Assemblyman Fred Thiel. Welcome. Good morning. We'll wait. Good morning. We'll wait for everybody to get in. Let me, can I just say, Mrs. Malloy, um, we do sure. not see Senator Palumbo. So if he's in under another name, if you could let us know, that would be fine. Otherwise, everybody who is here 
is on the panel. Great, wonderful, thank you. Okay, I think we can begin, Dr. Steichen. Okay, so we have questions um, from neighboring districts. Our first question uh, will be from Madison Frescona, a high school senior at Patchell Medford High School, Metro Medford School District. Hi. Um, Patrick Medford has already spent approximately $3.2 million in expenditures related to the COVID-19 pandemic. What specifically can you do to support our fiscal stability so we do not face massive layoffs, loss of instruction programs, and loss of extracurricular offerings for our students? Thank you. Okay, if anyone would like to respond to uh, Madison's question, the floor is open. Fred, do you want to go first? I, you, we're, we have the raise hand function. So, you know, typically, uh, and I see m members raising their hands and I was one of them. So that might be a way to kind of keep this orderly. You know, if every, every one of us as panelists, if you use the raise hand function, that might provide some order, who knows? So, uh, First of all, Maddie, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a great question. It really tees up, you know, the larger picture and the overall picture. And that is, uh, you know, school districts have, have had to face increased costs and increased responsibilities. And let me just say at the outset that, um, you know, schools have done a tremendous job. They have, I think, exceeded all expectations as far as being able to to uh, provide education, whether it be uh, remote, hybrid, uh, and in-person. Obviously, the goal is always in-person, but uh, during the pandemic, schools have been among the safest places in our community. So I, at, at the outset, I just want to say we recognize the challenges and the expenses and how incredibly well uh, our school districts have met those challenges. So um, to get to the point here, which is, you, you know, you're facing increased costs, uh, in, increased challenges, how can we help? And that, we start in the context of, of, of the budget. And you heard uh, in the earlier presentations that, um, um, you know, we, we have, we start with the governor's executive budget. And, uh, you know, there's a, a reliance and the need for federal funding. I, I should point out at the outset that federal funding is a one shot, it helps, you know, it, it helps in the short term, but we have long-term needs. Uh, the governor's budget provides, you know, increases and in, in, in for federal funding, in, uh, decreased state support. Uh, it has an unusual number of uh, distractions and deflections that are in the governor, that are usually in the governor's budget, whether they be including STAR as, uh, as part of uh, uh, as part of the state aid numbers, uh, combining expense-driven aids, um, a, you know, a local district ad adjustment. So let me just, you know, start out and say that, you know, the, whatever dollars we can get in federal funds are critical. And obviously we want to get every last dollar that we can get, both for the state, for school districts and local governments, because we need those dollars. I think that's first and foremost, but we do not want to set up uh, a, uh, a system here where we have one shot federal revenues that we can use for maybe this year and next year, and then we all fall off a cliff. This has to be sustainable. Um, so, uh, you know, I think what we can do, first of all, is reject most of these suggestions that the governor has put forward uh, that, that I perceive as hurting school districts, combining expense driven aids. Um, you know, putting star in the uh, uh, in the a in, in the in the school aid numbers. Um, yes, we need to to use all the federal dollars that we can get, but we also have to meet the state's responsibility. And uh, you know, as I say, there's a lot of deflection and distraction, and that keeps our eye off the ball. And that is that we you know we're still not fully funding foundation aid. Um, and I have school districts, Riverhead among them, that I share with uh, Assemblywoman Giglio, uh, which have never gotten uh, a, a, a their portion of, uh, of, of uh, foundation aid. So, you know, I, I, it's all, it, you know, we do need 
to, uh, I think, fight back against the governor's budget. Uh, we're going to need to provide the necessary resources to local governments. And that means this year, uh, and this is where I think, you know, there may be a partisan breakdown, but we're going to have to look at increased revenues and taxing the wealthy to be able to provide uh, long-term sustainability to education. And, and the, the last thing I just want to talk about as far as, because uh, it was mentioned, financial flexibility. Last year, I, I sponsored a bill that was enacted that provided flexibility to school districts, allowed them to use their uh, reserve funds for pandemic-related expenses, and, and a lot of school districts did. And uh, we need to build upon that this year. And uh, you know, uh, those funds would have to be paid back within five years and they would have to be paid back with interest. And, uh, you know, next week I'll be sponsoring, putting in a bill that would extend that period from five years to 10 years and eliminate the, the interest re requirement as far as uh, utilizing those funds. So uh, there's a lot here. I only scratched the surface, but overall, um, you know, I think that, in, in, you know, fight for federal dollars, provide the necessary state resources uh, to sustain education over the long haul, not just to get through this year. Um, reject some of these th uh, gimmicks that the governor has and provide flexibility to local governments to use the resources they already have. Thank you very much, um, Assemblyman Beal. Uh, Ms. Malloy, do we have... Um... Uh, Mr. Fuss Fitzpatrick? Yes, Assemblyman Fitzpatrick is here. Thank you for coming and joining us this morning. <laughs> uh, Mr. DiStefano. Yeah, good morning. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for the invite. It's always uh, a pleasure to join with your legislative committee and the, the school districts that are involved. Um, this is my third one. Uh, I always learn something. Every, every time I come on this, I learn something. And having established a, a rapport with a lot of them, one of the things that I think we need to do is, uh, I think we need to get the legislature back on equal branches. Uh, I think that's part of the problem is that we can't have one person dictating what it is that we need to do. We need to do it together. We need to have all branches of government working together to solve the problem. Uh, one of the things that we've uncovered during the year is a there's a lot of fraud in, in our government, in the Medicaid and specifically $700 million they found in fraud. That wasn't me that said it, that was the state comptroller who did an investigation that found that out. Think about that. If you had your $700 million that we found out was, it was fraud related, invested back into the schools, uh, where would we be today? We'll be having this discussion at this length. First of all, I want to shout out to Maddie for being my alma mater, Patrick Medford. Mr. Palumbo is from there as well. So I'm sure he'll say something about that. But uh, it's always a pleasure being with you guys. Um, you know, ethics laws, we, we talk about that. We, you know, these are the things that we want to make sure that we're all equal. We all do the same thing equally. Uh, and you'll find out the Long Island delegation is probably one of the most bipartisan groups in Albany. We always try to work together. Long Island is like a caucus. Uh, we, we try to make sure whether, what side of the aisle you come from. We always have Long Island's interest at heart. And, uh, and I know I can speak for my other colleagues that are on the other side, that we always try to do what's right for the people we represent. And going forward uh, with the commitment has always been here from us to do that. We always fight, um, you know, the, the foundation aid as, as Assemblyman Thiel, you know, it's never gonna be right. It's never gonna be the perfect combination. But the bottom line is we gotta keep fighting for what we believe is right. We can't be sending more money to Albany than we get back. We can't be sending more money to Washington than we get back. We need to fight for every dollar that's available because in essence, we're the ones paying the bill and we should get what we need for our constituents. And uh, Maddie, that's a great question. And uh, go Raiders. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you, Mr. DeStefano. Uh, uh, Assembly, uh, Senator Palumbo. I believe you're on mute. Uh, Mr. Palumbo, you're on you mute. Okay? Can you hear me all right? <laughs> Yes. Yep. All right. Good. I thought I had total control of my mute button, but apparently <laughs> I have the authorization now. Um, but I just wanted to say thanks for having me. You know, after many years in the assembly, um, you know, we always make this breakfast because you folks certainly do God's work. Um, I know I use that phrase a lot, but you know, now and during this pandemic, dealing with what we're dealing with, um, you know, you're really on the front line. So we do appreciate what you do. Um, and Maddie, now, are you related at all to Anthony or Lisa? 
Lisa was in my class and I played ball with Anthony. Um, so I'm a true Red Raider. I'm so much, I'm a lot younger than Assemblyman Stefano. So, you know, he's <laughs> right, Joe. I mean, yeah, I mean you many, are. many, no many one, years man. younger. So, you know, he wouldn't know them, but um, please tell them hello for me. Um, you know, they, they, we, were, we were all good friends. So um, it's nice to see you and congrats. Oh, wait, do I see him in the back there? There he is. What's up, coach? There he is. Hey, how you, you doing? Are throwing the first baseman or what? Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. You too, to man. You. Now, if you don't know, Maddie's dad is is a coach of our beloved uh, Raiders baseball team, and uh, it's just good to see you. And and Maddie, you're you're, you're doing a, a wonderful job. Thank um, you. But obviously, you, you know, as Assemblyman Thiel also mentioned, it's always good to go after Fred because he's extremely thorough. Um, and he hits all the appropriate points. I mean, this is dependent on federal aid this year. I know we do have additional CARES Act money um, that I, I believe needs to be distributed as well. So, you know, hopefully we've got the previous influx of money and a current large influx that will at least get us through and give us some breathing room this year um, because we need to adequately fund our schools, obviously. We, we, and I've said this many, many times, um, you know, we're not only morally obligated, we're constitutionally obligated to do so. so. Um, you know, it's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of fights in the next few months, but that's a great question, Maddie, and it's really nice to see you. Thank you very much. Um, with that being said, I just wanted to uh, give a quick reminder. Um, we have about an hour for questions. We are only on our first question. So uh, with that being said, we need to make sure that we give everyone equal amount of time to speak. Um, our next um, person would be Mr. Fitzpatrick. Very good. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, thanks for the question, Maddie. Uh, you know, I, I think with the federal assistance that's uh, coming our way, uh, I think in the end, the budget is going to be in reasonably decent shape you know, for our school districts, but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods. Uh, I believe we're a long way from uh, getting out uh, the other end of the tunnel with this pandemic and what impact it's going to have on our tax base and on our economy. And I think we all need to be concerned about that because, uh, you know, looking to the feds to solve our problems is fine in the short term. In the long term, I think public education and government at every level is going to have to look at how can we change? What can we do more efficiently? What can we do better? How can we do more in a sense with less? Because what the pandemic has shown is that look how we're meeting now over Zoom. Uh, there are a lot of office buildings uh, in the city of New York and around the state that are sitting virtually empty right now because of the pandemic. And going forward, uh, companies have found that this is a, a, a very efficient way of conducting business. Uh, will we ever go back to the way we were? We don't know, but probably not all the way back to the way we were. That's going to have an impact on our tax base. Uh, on how much revenue is collected by the state, uh, the cities, the counties, towns, and school districts. Uh, so I think we're going to have to look at uh, cost-saving measures. Uh, I've always advocated, you know, moving new hires uh, from a defined benefit pension to a defined contribution platform that they use at SUNY. 70% uh, of the instructional staff at SUNY uses the defined contribution platform. It's portable, it works well, and it's a lower cost option. Uh, for the university. Well, if it's good enough for our university professors, it's good enough for our K-12 uh, staff as well. This is something that needs to be done is long overdue in my view. Uh, looking at mandates is important as well, but I think public education is going to have to look at uh, how, how can we restructure uh, to meet, uh, you know, not only future demands, but the limits uh, that we're going to see in revenue. Yeah, there's a, there are proposals to you know, tax the rich. Uh, that's always popular, but the rich can move. You know, labor and capital are mobile and people are moving to lower cost states. Uh, there's a proposal to tax stock transactions. Uh, I would uh, advise everyone to read Errol Lewis's column in the Daily News about why that's a bad idea. Uh, you know, exchanges are all done by computer today. Uh, so we will, we will see a further erosion of our tax base as, uh, as our more progressive colleagues look to raise, uh, raise revenue. So we're, we're going to have to restructure and look at becoming more efficient as, as public entities, in my view. 
Thank you so much. Um, Selena Smith, did you have your hand raised at one point or? I did, but we can move along because we're low on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Malloy? Hey, thank you, Dr. Sidham. Okay, so our next question comes from a high school senior from Mattituck Kutchog High School, Maya Orlowski. Good morning, thank you for having me. Good morning. Assembly Chad Thiel, retired Senator Ken Laval, former Assemblyman Anthony Palumbo, and now Senator Palumbo, has worked for several years to support our young people's behavioral health needs on the North and South Fork. This support is greatly appreciated. The East End has unique needs and must have support to provide crises, intervention, and follow-up treatment for children and families. The North and South Work initiatives collaborate with Family Service League and Stony Brook Medicine and a range of other professionals and local leaders are school districts. New York State funding provided the critical funding for both. Last year, funding for the North Fork was not included due to the budget processes complicated nature during the pandemic. While the region managed through time-specific grants and other sources to keep the level of services going, we all know the impact the pandemic has had on families' behavioral health needs. The systems are strained, debilitating social emotional health issues, substance use disorders, and mental health disorders are rising. With the recent loss of sophomore Ryan Oliver, Mattituck is in need of support for all of our students and administration during this devastating time. How will you approach the restoration of mental health funding and expand the efforts on the East End to avoid the increasing evidence that we are heading towards a crisis in our region? Thank you, Maya. Okay, Assemblywoman Giglio, would you like to respond? Thank you for your question, Maya. I think it's a great one. And I think it's one of the biggest struggles that school districts are facing these days with the pandemic and our students being at home and our teachers being at home, our superintendents and our educators are doing the best they can to make sure that mental health is a priority, uh, knowing firsthand in my kids being in Riverhead High School in 11th grade and also in the BOCES program. I think that we need to, uh, we are talking about including marijuana in the budget. I think that is a big problem, especially on the North Fork of Long Island, where we have a lot of farms and a lot of capabilities for every farm to turn from food to marijuana crops. And um, I'm very concerned about it, but I think that it, uh, the money that's coming into the school district budgets, we need to allow for more flexibility in our educators to determine how that money should be allocated to the needs of the individual um, areas, whether it's the discretionary funding and the foundation aid and allocating money to make sure that if mental health is one of the biggest issues that we're facing, that there should be more money um, being able to be put into that account to be used. And it's our educators that are identifying where their school budget money needs to get spent. And we need to allow more flexibility during these difficult times to make sure that the mental health of our educators and our students is addressed as number one priority. Uh, we're hearing all throughout the country of uh, depression and honor students and uh, athlete, athletes that are committing suicide. And it's, it's not acceptable. And we need to make sure that the mental health of our teachers and our students is number one priority and give the flexibility to the superintendents and the educators to make sure that we address that. And I will support anything for mental health that any school district sees and look forward to recommendations from the school districts as to how we can best help them. Thank you. Senator Palumbo. Thank you. And um, Maya, that is, that is a, a great question. Obviously, I mean, I, I actually know the Oliver family very well. So our thoughts and prayers are with them. I mean, that was tragic. And that's, you know, you just, it can hit anyone. As you can see, that's, that's really the concern. And that, uh, you know, that that's a, was a wonderful athlete, you know, great kid, great student, you know, and it's just shocking to the world. Um, so that's that was of great concern, and on, on 2019, Assemblyman Thiel has been 
um, very instrumental in obtaining funding um, for, uh, for, for really both of these. Senator Laval and he created this program. We, we had on the South Fork initially, um, we did a mirror one up in my district when I was in the assembly. And um, unfortunately last year we lost the funding due to those budget constraints. Um, and uh, you know, to be perfectly frank, there may have been a little politics involved in that as well. But at the end of the day, um, this is not an expensive program. Fortunately, it was able to find another, an, another source of funding for this cycle. Um, but this is critical because we're underserved on the East End, as you know, that we have had a, a tough issues because we don't have you know, Mather Hospital and Brookhaven and Stony Brook and these huge other hospitals. So now that we do have Stony Brook affiliates, thank goodness, we are better served. But if you're in Montauk and you have a critical injury, your closest hospital is Southampton. So you need to get all the way to Stony Brook. That's why we airlift so many people in major, with major injuries and so forth. And out here, we had only either a clinical setting in a hospital or someone like a school nurse who certainly has some training, but not necessarily intermediate mental health training. So this program is critical. Um, we will really fight to get it back in the budget and get that funding and keep it going because particularly during this pandemic, um, it's obviously needed as we've seen in the past few weeks, but thank you for your question, Maya, that's wonderful. Thank you, Senator. Senator Weick, would you like to respond? Thank you. Um, you know what, first of all, Maya, that's a great question. And it's a great question that's so timely because students have always been under so much stress when they were standardized, te standardized testing, that was a stressor. You have cyberbullying, there's drug use. Those are the normal things that tend to weigh down on a student. And now to have COVID and have isolationism and start-stop education, it's really taking its toll. And, and doing virtual education more than being in person, uh, there's so many, I'm so proud of our schools for recognizing how escalated mental health is at this time because we don't necessarily notice as parents that children are stressing out, not realizing that their homework doesn't have to be perfect when it's virtual. Um, that's something that we, I have a high school student and, and something I didn't realize that, you know, when they're doing homework and when they're doing classwork, it's not in person. And so very often you think you have this opportunity to redo it if you're recording something before you submit it. And that takes its toll. That's a minor issue that's taking its toll on students, but it's adding up. It's every single class that it's doing this to our students. So I completely support and I will support as we move forward to make sure there's plenty of funding within our budget that addresses mental health issues. There's domestic abuse. There's so much more that's going on and things that were a problem have now been so exacerbated that I think this is a bigger issue than it ever was before. And so I would fully support. I see, I recognize that every school district is having this issue and we do need to be working with our mental health uh, providers to make sure that we have these services for not just our students, but for our teachers and administrators as well. It really is taking its toll on everybody. And so I would, I would be in full support of any legislation that puts extra funding in four schools for that. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Matera, did you want to comment? You're on mute. Hi, Maya, and I thank you so, so much. I'm gonna, you know, as a new Senator and somebody that's uh, been involved with uh, the school district and been involved, my daughter, she's a senior right now. She's the head captain of the uh, champion Whisperettes. And I just seen what she's been going through. The biggest thing right now, the hurdle is we even tomorrow have a rally, a car rally to get our children back to school. Um, we see the numbers, we see the numbers are, uh, are, are low in our school district because of our educators, the staff, our, our cleaners, what they've been doing, our custodians, our janitors. We need, that is so important. I understand we have hybrid, you know, we have the remote and everything like that. When one day I came home and I watched my daughter sitting there in the kitchen and she was doing push-ups, and I go, what are you doing? And she goes, I'm doing gym class. I went like this, I go, you know what? We have to get our children back to class. We, we need, they need to have interaction with the educators, interaction with the fellow students, especially this end, end of the year um, situation. I'm so excited about the sports and everything like that, because you remember, you guys sit dormant. I know how with children, I know that we can't, we can't sit stagnant. We need to get out, we need to be around. But I really commend our teachers because our educators, they became therapists in a lot of ways. And we need to just like what Senator uh, White just said, Perfect example. We need to fund this because this mental health situation is definitely going to increase and we need to be ahead of the curve. 
Again, I'm a preventive maintenance person with everything in my life. This is so, so important. So let's you, come on, you can help us write legislation and get this done. And I know everybody here on this panel is going to be there to make sure that this gets that's done because you got some great talent that's sitting here as legislators, my, the colleagues that I'm dealing with because they're all mentors to me. And you know what? You're a mentor, just what you just came up with today. And you know what? Let's get this done together. And I appreciate what you have done. And thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Okay, um, Assemblyman Thiel, I know you yeah. wanted to comment. We got to keep moving. Holy I know, but uh, th this is a program <laughs> but, we work very, very hard on on the East End. And there, it's a specific question about a specific program that I think deserves a specific answer. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, to be, you know, to, to give the, some context here, uh, Maya, just as you referenced a, a tragic suicide on the North Fork, this program started on the South Fork because of grassroots efforts in, in the in the East Hampton School District uh, with regard to suicides that we had there. And, and uh, Senator Laval and I brought all of the stakeholders together, the school districts, mental health professionals, the local towns, uh, the hospitals, mental health providers, and they devised a program first on the South Fork to provide more school-based mental health services uh, to uh, respond better on the East End because of the lack of services, particularly with regard to crisis situations. It started on the South Fork. Uh, it was done so well there that uh, uh, the North Fork uh, copied the same program. So we have it across the East End. And it has been incredibly successful. Uh, it has worked incredibly well. And as you mentioned last year, the, the, the funding for the North Fork did not make it into the budget. And I have to point out that the governor never provides this funding. These are legislative ads and the assembly has always added for the South Fork and the Senate added for the North Fork. And then last year, the North Fork funding didn't get added. Uh, and as Senator Palumbo said, we've been able to keep the program afloat on the North Fork uh, in spite of that. But, um, and by the way, you deserve, uh, you should go to diplomacy school for the way you described the, the way that the funding didn't happen. Uh, it was way too much politics in an election year and who had what district and what election was going on. There is absolutely no excuse uh, for any politics to enter into with programs like this. There's the need for, uh, for not just restoring this funding, but increasing this funding and not just for the North Fork and the South Fork, but across uh, all of New York State, uh, but for the programs on the North Fork and the South Fork, because that's the areas that uh, uh, Senator Palumbo and uh, Assemblyman, Assemblywoman Giglio and I represent, you know, we're going to be working together in a bipartisan fashion. We're going to be, we're going to be signing a budget letter that doesn't just ask for money for the North Fork and the South Fork uh, and its continuation and its restoration, but we want to increase that funding. So you can be assured it'll be a bipartisan effort. And in, in the wake of the pandemic, when mental health services are in such uh, increased demand more than ever before. Uh, these, this funding has to be included and politics needs to be set aside. Thank you very much. Okay, our next Thanks. question comes from Ms. Sharon Dungy, Superintendent of Schools at Central Islip School District. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Are you able to hear me, Ms. Malloy? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all for your service for us all. Now that we have seen the governor's proposed budget, yet again, we see the requirements for community set aside. Would you support removing the community set aside requirements? And ultimately, what do you project fi final state aid numbers will be for Long Island school districts in this year with the, the, the dire need for funding. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I uh, don't see any hand raised. <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess? Take a shot. Okay, Assemblyman, Mr. Assemblyman Doug Smith. Okay, it's so good to be here with all of you. And thank you. I'm looking at the school aid runs for Central Islip. So I see that you have a $2 million uh, community set aside this year. So I can see why that, um, especially in this type of year, is particularly uh, 
devastating when we're trying to uphold programs and continue uh, serving the community. Uh, generally with the community schools set aside, uh, I generally support the concept, but I do think that in a very tough budget year when we're dealing with these things, uh, it is something that should be taken into account. Um, you know, obviously we do want to provide these things to the community. Um, uh, our, our school district, our, our schools are the center of the community and someone who uh, my background as a teacher, I'm a high, I was a certified high school math teacher, grade seven through 12. Uh, and I, I love the community school model, the idea that people could get services in their school, uh, particularly uh, families that uh, may not be able to get uh, the services elsewhere. So I do think that that's an important thing. Uh, but as we're talking about um, this school year and the last school year, uh, the idea of how we change uh, using our school buildings. And you remember early on uh, during uh, the beginning days of the pandemic with SCOPE, where some of our school facilities were being used to um, basically for child care for first responders. I mean, the fact is, and, and as anybody in education will tell you, uh, you know, our job is to educate students. It's not as a babysitting or child care service. However, there, you know, early on, it was pretty quickly realized that uh, society can't continue to function if uh, people have no place to put their kids, especially during a tough time. Um, but I do think we do need to get creative this year. Um, I think that, uh, and a few of the questions later in the program are gonna come up about how uh, the school aid runs were changed this year that I think are uh, not helpful. And I hope that we can you know, uncompress the uh, lines of school aid, the reimbursable aid. I hope that we can get clarification on things. Uh, I don't know about Central Islip, and I do represent a, a small portion. Uh, I have a, a little bit of Islandia in my district, um, but, uh, the fact is, you know, school districts had to make tough choices uh, with the busing contracts, for example. I know every school district had this question of uh, uncertainty of whether the state would reimburse uh, services for transportation when you have a transportation contract, but uh, no students to transport necessarily. Uh, and I think that that's been, you know, touched in the in the budget a little bit. I, I wish we would get further clarification. Uh, my district, and, and again, Central Islip, just down the road, Vets Highway uh, in Ronkonkoma, the Bauman Bus Company, I, I've been shouting this from the rooftops, they went out of business, 1,400 employees, 900 bus drivers. These are people that live in, in our community uh, that it just further adds uh, to the unemployment issue and the, the tough times. Uh, now I'm speaking with our school districts and they're having a tough time uh, re-entering into transportation contracts because, you know, particularly some of our larger districts, I represent a small part of Central Islip, but I also have Satrum, Middle Country, Connectquat. Uh, the larger districts were getting a great rate for busing if they don't have their own buses. Uh, but uh, now that uh, some there's been some interruption in uh, contracts, uh, that there might be an issue now to, to re-engage that. So I think we do have a number of issues. Um, the fact that schools now have had to spend money, there's, there's definitely a digital equity issue. So when we're talking about community schools, I think it's important and community set aside, I think it's important to talk about the digital equity issue. So our school districts, uh, many of them want to do a one-to-one -one program where uh, going forward, they could provide one device per student, but it's just completely unfeasible. Uh, and I know our libraries have been rushing to try to meet the need by uh, blending out mobile hotspots uh, when possible. Um, but it's just something that uh, I think no one really foresaw. Uh, and I think uh, we really do need to get creative. Uh, for the first question that I wanted to add in the beginning, um, and I think uh, Assemblyman Thiel did a superb job. We are really relying a lot on the federal government. Uh, it was good to see the final round of the final package of aid we got did include funding for the schools. But I mean, I think all of us were really expecting that package last July. I mean, I remember last year we passed the state budget. Uh, it was something that I personally could not support um, because the language in the budget uh, allowed the governor to reduce any uh, local aids. Uh, and then, you know, I, I was under the impression we were going to get a revised spending plan that we could vote on, uh, or if no action was taken, you know, the, the governor's proposals would go forward. But that was really contingent upon a federal plan that never came until January. Uh, so I think that that's just um, very problematic. I, I do think... Um, at least here on Long Island and in the state of New York, uh, as Assemblyman Stefano said, we do work together very well uh, across party lines for our Long Island uh, students and schools. Um, and I think that uh, it's important to continue. I think our federal representatives are, we're all firing in the same direction. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, the new administration, I, I 
it does seem that they're making this a priority. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, we do see additional aid to the state of New York um, because we do, again, we're consistently, I don't care what anybody says, we contribute significantly more than we get back. So even when you're talking about the SALT deduction, I'm sorry, even with being able to write off our state and local taxes, which by the way, the state of New York and our local governments provide a lot of the services that the federal government provides elsewhere. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have such excellent schools. So um, maybe we'll see movement on that as well. But uh, to this point, the community set aside, I think it's um, worth talking about. I just, you know, as an educator, it, it just, um, it's, it's you, you know, as well as I do, it's a tough one because we want to provide the community the services that we know that they need. Uh, but at the same token, uh, this is, it's a tough year. And, and the federal aid, unfortunately, is supplanting, not supplementing the state aid at this time. So I hope that helps answer a, a little bit. Thanks. It does, and I truly appreciate your responding to my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Ms. Dungy, and thank you, Assemblyman Smith, um, for your response. Ms. Malloy? Thank you, Dr. Statham. Okay, our next question comes from Longwood School District, uh, somebody that you may be familiar with, um, another school board member and colleague, uh, Daniel Tomaszewski. Can you hear me, Vic? I can hear you, yes. Hey, sorry, my computer shut down for a second. That's okay. Um, first of all, Vicki and Rhonda, great job. I'm so proud of both of you pulling this off. Uh, uh, wonderful. And uh, to all of our elected officials, on behalf of a grateful community, I would like to extend our, our gratitude to each and every one of you for your Herculean efforts uh, to support our children's education, especially during these very difficult circumstances. Thank you so much. And my question, for the first time, STAR money has been included in the state aid runs. The total amount of STAR funding in the runs decreased by $91.5 million. Since STAR funding is used to directly offset a portion of our residents' property tax bills, is this an indication that our tax levy will not be made whole? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, um, Assemblyman Engelbright, would you like to respond? I'll try to get a response. The, uh, the answer is that there's a good likelihood that uh, it does indicate that the tax levy is being messed with. Uh, a little earlier, uh, Fred Field described the governor's budget as containing much deflection and distraction. I think part of what uh, Fred was referring to was the commingling of uh, of, of uh, the uh, the star funding uh, with uh, uh, state aid runs, uh, they should be separated, and by blending them together like this is sort of like mixing uh, different colors of paint randomly and hoping that you come up with a bright a brighter color than brown. Um, uh, that that's unlikely. Uh, so we need to tease these apart and see what the real impact is, and again. Uh, the, the, the big overarching reality is that until we find out uh, what we're working with in terms of federal aid uh, and reimbursement, um, that we're all sort of uh, uh, in, in the shadows uh, of, of understanding uh, what it's going to look like next year, uh, because that, that's the big variable that will control an awful lot of what we'll be able to do. Thank you very much. Um, Assemblyman Thiel. Yes, the, you know, the STAR program has been in effect for well over 20 years now. And I, I dare say it's the most popular program that has ever been enacted by the state legislature. And you know, it's, it's been very helpful to school districts uh, by, by helping to keep property taxes lower, by offsetting uh, the cost of property taxes. As I said, most popular program that I'm aware of, and the governor slowly but surely every year tries to one step at a time dismantle it. Uh, you know, and again, it's all budget gimmicks about trying to meet the two percent his two percent spending cap uh, by changing. First of all, changing this program from an exemption program where school districts get reimbursed to a credit program, and then this is another gimmick that's designed because of the federal dollars that we are going to get 
but there's a there's a, a maintenance of effort requirement, and this is a, an attempt to kind of get around that maintenance of effort. So, listen, I, I think you know it, it's it all looks promising about federal dollars coming and 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 uh, the bill that's winding its way through the Congress. Uh, you know, whether it's Star or, or or other funding, you know, I'm convinced you're going to get your funding this year uh, because of the federal dollars. But as I said before, it's a one shot. My fear is how do we construct this budget so that after the federal money dis uh, after the federal money disappears, we don't fall off of a cliff. And that's the danger here is that you set up this 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 pretext with Star, and then suddenly you know the the, the dollars aren't there to fund the Star money to local school districts in out years. So we need to reject this, um, and you know we should leave the Star program alone. People like the STAR program, it works. Uh, and just because, you know, for some budget gymnastics in Albany, we shouldn't be messing with it. Thank you. Senator White, did you want to comment? Sure, I mean, Assemblyman Thiel and uh, Engelbright certainly did a great job explaining, but I will say that we, it's most likely we're going to look at you know, a, a deficit because when you include the star amount, which is an obligation to pay our taxpayers, it's not funding to our schools. When you pull that amount out of the budget and, and it is, it's falsely put in there, it's a gimmick, it's made it, it's designed to make it look like the governor is giving schools more, more funding. But when you pull that out and you pay it to the taxpayers, you're still missing that amount of money. So no matter how you slice it, you're going to come up short. So our schools are being shortchanged by their state aid. So uh, it's just a gimmick and we're gonna have to work around it. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Steitham. Our next question comes from um, Eastern Suffolk BOCES, Ava Mangiello, a senior at Sequoia High School and clinical medical assistant class at the Millican Technical Center. Good morning. Um, so my question is, once again, in the executive um, budget proposal, there is a plan to combine expense driven aid categories into one general category referred to as service aid, which is also then reduced by $400,000 and has no year to year accelerator. As you know, districts are reimbursed within individual aid categories commensurate with the use of certain services based on individual needs. This includes BOCES aid, which helps offset the costs that districts incur from sending students to career and technical training programs. Having separate aid categories allows districts to plan with some predictability. Would you support opposing the proposal so that districts can be reimbursed for their actual usage? Thank you so much. Anyone? Uh, Assemblyman Smith? Thank you so much, Ava, for your question. I think it's awesome. You attend uh, Sequoia uh, High School now in the heart of my district in Holtzville. Um, I hope you are having a good experience. Um, I think that uh, it's very important to note in the state aid uh, runs this year that the fact that these expense-driven aids were uh, compressed into one line, which I think is incredibly problematic. I think it's a major step backwards because uh, I think um, you know many of us, especially in the education field, would actually like to see, um, you know, the addition and in past years, we've talked about the possibility and it's, it's uh, feasibility of adding additional expense driven aids, perhaps one for mental health, perhaps one for school security and safety. Uh, but the fact that we've now kind of uh, walked this backwards, so I'm hoping that next year we can make sure that this doesn't happen uh, because it is important to know how much we are spending on those in individual uh, programs. And I think uh, BOCES and our technical education programs are incredibly important as, you know, uh, to build a healthy economy, we need a healthy career track and higher edu you know, education track. And actually higher education can be many different forms. So I think that uh, in, in recent years, we've uh, talked about this, particularly with this breakfast. I think this is my 11th year attending this breakfast, fourth year as an assembly member. So uh, I do love that this question, uh, unfortunately we're phrasing it this way because of the current uh, conundrum we find ourselves in. But the fact is uh, these career and technical training programs are so uh, important. And I see that my colleague, Senator Mario Matera's hand is raised and he has more experience with this than any of us. So I'll stop talking, but Eva, thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Senator Matero. 
Eva, thank you so much for this. Um, you know, my background is construction. I'm actually the business agent with the Plumbers Union. I went through the apprenticeship program. So it was a four-year program, was important. And uh, BOCES is so important for our careers, for our, our future, for our construction, not just construction and other fields. I know there's even uh, beauty salon, you know, with the, uh, all kinds of things. Excuse me, what am I saying it right? For, for hair cutting, whatever it is, BOCES is so, so important for our future, for 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 our kids that, in other words, do not want to go and attend, you know, college. They want to go into a career with the construction trades, get into an apprenticeship program moving forward. And we need to make sure that we have that because there's a lot of kids today that do not care about getting their hands dirty or going to work. But and the parents are the parents are like, no, I want my kids to go to college. I, you know, I'm a regular layman type of person to say it, that, in other words, there's a lot of children that really need to go to the BOCES so this way for their future, they can be educated, especially in the trades. And we do need tradesmen for our future because the construction industry is getting less and less and less with uh, the trades people. So I will always be something that we advocate to uh, make sure that we uh, have monies funded in the BOCES program. So you'll get, you'll understand that with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Matera. Uh, Senator Boyle? Yes, thank you. That, that was a great question. And I, I agree with uh, Senator Matera regarding the BOCES program. The, the way I look at what the governor's trying in, in, in this, uh, changing whether it's STAR, whether it's changing the formulas, it's all an effort to hurt Long Island. Not purposely, but that's the end result. Uh, and so we, as a bipartisan uh, legis uh, legislative representatives in the Senate and the Assembly from Suffolk County and all of Long Island uh, need to say, look, the, these formulas are important to Long Island schools. I know that it's gonna help New York City. There's no question about it if it, did, if it stayed the way it was. So never has it been more important for us to work in a bipartisan fashion. And we are, and we will continue to do it. It's a little tougher, obviously virtually going up there, but uh, uh, we need to keep the formulas the way they are and actually make them better for Long Island uh, uh, in, in the years to come. Certainly keeping a STAR program protected a thousand percent. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Thiel? Yeah, just very quickly, you know, the governor, I think, has proposed this several times, certainly last year, and I think at least the last two years. Um, not that we don't have to fight really, really hard, because we always do, but the legislature on a bipartisan re basis has rejected this, and I expect we're going to reject it again this year. So, you know, obviously we have to fight, but I, I mean, I, I, this is one of those things I'm, you know, very optimistic because, you know, this, this has been rejected before. I expect it to be rejected again. Okay, thank you so much for your response, Ms. Malloy. Thank you, Dr. Statham. Okay, uh, question number six out of nine comes from Middle School Country District, Middle Country School District, I'm sorry. <laughs> Logan Mazer from Newfield High School. He is a senior. Logan? Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Recently, Recently, Middle Country received a notice from the Suffolk County Board of Elections that a special election is scheduled for March 23rd and that several of our schools will be utilized as polling sites. Not only will our security practices be put on hold because we are required to let unknown adults into our schools, but our health and safety practices are going to have to be suspended as well. Due to COVID-19, we rarely allow visitors into our schools and everyone, including staff who do enter the buildings, sign in and complete a health attestation form upon arrival. Names and addresses of any non-staff are always obtained for contract tracing purposes. We have advocated before, but that, that district should have the right to decline for school, safe, sc school security reasons, I'm sorry, to serve as polling sites when schools are in session. Now we add health safety to that advocacy. Schools, as Governor Cuomo have said, aren't big COVID-19 transmission centers, primarily because of the health guidelines we rigorously follow. These, these are the guidelines we would have to ignore if our schools are used as polling sites. We know that recently Senate Bill S-2703, formerly S-116, has been referred to the Senate Elections Committee. We would like to know if you are in support of this bill so that we could work together to keep our students and staff safe. Thank you very much. Okay, Assemblyman Engelbright, would you like to respond? Um, not really, but I'm, I'm, I will. Oh, I saw your hand up. I'm sorry. I <laughs> no, no, I'm going to respond. There. I would okay. like to respond, but the, <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, you know, um, we, we have just seen, for example, uh, a very difficult election. Um, 
I think I was the last or next to last person in the whole state to have um, uh, his uh, votes uh, actually recorded. Um, we, we've, we've really had a, uh, a, a, a terrible year. Uh, the Board of Elections uh, had an outbreak of COVID uh, during the count. Um, I, I hold those people in high regard, just as I hold the school district in high regard. And it anguishes me to see these two institutions of uh, our democracy and our optimism for the future uh, pitted against one another with a, with a question of, uh, uh, that is rightly posed um, of uh, what, uh, how, how to proceed uh, to have public fun both public functions uh, carrying forward uh, within uh, school buildings. Uh, and it's not an easy uh, question. I don't, I'm not familiar with the Senate bill I'm in the assembly. I'm not acquainted with um, what the Senate bill says, but I am acquainted with this issue. It came up uh, the last couple of years. Um, and uh, so let me just react to the situation. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge that uh, the schools have a right to object uh, and they need an appeals process. Uh, that doesn't, that's not well defined at the moment doesn't seem to really exist. <clears throat> it's a sort of uh, oppressive situation where because it's a publicly owned building, uh, the Board of Elections has the ability to override uh, local objections. Sometimes those local objections are based on the site access geometry for safety. Um, different schools are laid out differently and the public may not be isolatable uh, in certain circumstances. Um, we need to have uh, a better understanding of those site geometries. Uh, they should be mapped. And um, we really need to have a, a broader understanding in the form of an inventory of what uh, sites, alternate sites may be uh, available because if a school district says, you know, really we have to walk uh, through classroom space to get to the gymnasium, um, and we have no control uh, for safety purposes uh, because of the geometry of the school, uh, we should have an idea of where there are in the community other uh, sites that can, be, uh, that can be turned to during an appeals process. Um, and I think what we really need here is a dialogue with the Board of Elections uh, on this issue and a little bit of forethought uh, so that uh, we don't end up with having a crisis um, uh, you know, that, that already has expressed itself here, uh, accelerated and, and made worse uh, because we haven't attended to it. Um, I would be willing to help open that dialogue with the Board of Elections. As I indicated at the beginning here, I greatly respect the Board of Elections and the work they do. And I don't want uh, as an unintended consequence of a legitimate question posed uh, by the school districts to see the inadvertent uh, uh, possibility of voter suppression. Um, but I think we need to be able to uh, blend these two public purposes uh, together. Again, it, it is uh, something that has been done historically for decades. Uh, we need to get back to some semblance of uh, organized uh, possibility and we're gonna have to talk to one another. So instead of you know, just having the Board of Elections send missives and the school districts uh, respond uh, in the absence of an appeals process or a knowledge of uh, what other sites may be available, we need to think that through uh, at times such as this. Thank you. Assemblyman Smith. Thank you so much. And Logan, thank you for the question. It's good to see you. Um, I think Middle Country School District has done such great work. Assemblyman Engelbright, uh, Senator Matera, and I share Middle Country. Uh, Joe DeStefano has a piece of it as well. Um, 
And I want to just say for this issue, and this is something I've long supported, I have a bill in as well. Uh, in the Assembly, Sandy Galef, I believe, is leading the charge on this. She's got a good piece of legislation. Uh, but there's nothing actually in the law that states that polling places must be publicly owned facilities. So it's, it's I think it's a misnomer. Uh, one of our um, polling places in the town of Islip, I believe is the Bayshore Ford dealership. So if we can hold a voting, and I see Senator Boyle shaking his head because he gets elected there. Uh, if we can hold a polling place at the Bayshore Ford dealership, I'm certain we could find other locations that would be suitable. Uh, obviously you need them to be accessible. Uh, and they need to be centrally located. So there is, I will say, there is an advantage for having your elementary school as your polling place because it's right in the community. We know where it is. Maybe the high school is a polling place. I think, uh, you know, our libraries. But there are other locations that could be suitable. Um, I wish the Board of Elections would really spend more time thinking about this. Um, I will echo, you know, they, they do care, but it is tough work. You know, there's an entire team of people that scout out the locations for what uh, can be a polling place. And even with that, there's still issues. Now, I was elected during a special election a few years back, and that was incredibly problematic. It was a school day. And while on a general election day, we can cancel school, uh, oftentimes we may only have you know, 10 weeks notice before a special election pops up. And it may not be for every locality and you may not have any way to anticipate this. So, so I would support that bill. I, I again, I sponsor a piece of legislation that does something similar. Uh, and Sandy Galef, one of our colleagues, well-respected in the New York State Assembly has a bill as well. I think it's time to bring polling places out of the school buildings. Um, you know, there's no place that we count on to be more secure. So for that reason, I would definitely support that. Uh, Senator Boyle. Yes, thank you. A great question, Logan. And uh, Assemblyman Smith is right. We actually do have a polling place at a, a Ford dealership in Bayshore. It's actually the district that I get my highest percentage votes in. So I think they should all be at car dealerships. <laughs> um, but uh, you think about it. We have such security in our, in our schools, rightfully so. And what's the one day or a couple of days a year that people can just walk into the schools? It's on a voting day, on an election day, right? That has to change. I had legislation originally to do something along the lines of the Senate bill, which I strongly support. Uh, we can move away from the use of schools. If it's a national election and there's no school that day, fine, that's, that, that's perfectly well. But as long as there's kids in the schools, there's students in the schools, we need to protect them and we need to find other ways of doing it. And schools should definitely be able to opt out. But thank you for the question, great point. Okay, assemble them into Stefano. Thank you, Logan. Great question. Uh, yes, I would support that bill. But uh, more importantly, uh, Patrick Mefford has a, a student of the month uh, award for uh, students deserving of that. I'm sure other school districts have it as well. I can't go into that school district without giving up my first child before I can walk through the door with my ID and everything else that goes with it. But yet we're going to allow we're going to allow strangers to walk through our schools when we have, you know, people that we don't know walking through there. We don't even need ID to vote. Uh, so you really don't even know who it is that's coming into your schools. Uh, the, the second part of that is, so I would support the bill, but again, uh, you, you can't go into any school without providing some type of an ID if you have to do official business in the school. The second part is the unfunded mandates. Uh, we, or anybody who works in municipalities knows that the districts are saddle, saddled with unfunded mandates. And this is one of those things that the state tells you you have to do something, but yet they don't help you fit the bill to pay for it. And to me, when we're working on a 1.23% um, you know, uh, tax cap, it's hard, to, it's hard to imagine that now you have to hire extra security to be in the school while your school is open and you have people, strangers basically walking through your schools. Uh, again, if you want us to do something, we should be paying for it. Uh, we should not be putting the burden on the school districts or any other municipality that is saddled with the unfunded mandates. That is my biggest pet peeve in Albany is that everything that we, we, uh, we, we put on uh, our municipalities, but yet we don't help them pay for it. Uh, so I always wanted to advocate for trying to get a committee together to see what underfunded mandates we can do away with. And that would probably be one of the top ones that I would support. So, thank you. Thank you. Ass Assemblyman Fitzpatrick. Yeah, I, uh, thanks for the question. I, uh, I, I, I'm not supportive of this bill because I think schools are uniquely suited uh, to provide uh, space for voting. They are community facilities under the zoning law. And who is going to vote in the schools? It's the surrounding two, three, four election districts, which means these are your friends and your neighbors who are using the school to vote. 
they have gymnasiums and they have outside access so you don't have to go in through the main hallway. And if there is a school uh, that's currently utilized that doesn't have outside access, then that location maybe should be reviewed and find an alternate location. But I think, you know, I have voted in an elementary school and a high school. Uh, you go in through the back door, there is security. Uh, and especially if we're talking about a special election, the turnout will be extremely light. So the risk of, of COVID or anything else is extreme, would be extremely low. And I think as more people get vaccinated, this is, becomes less and less of a problem. Uh, it is not easy to find alternate locations, whether they be libraries, firehouses, or others. There may not be ample parking. Uh, you know, fire districts, you know, what if there's a call for a fire and you've got people in there voting? Uh, that's a potential problem. So schools, when you get right down to it, in my view, schools are really the best places to have voting and uh, they should always be uh, 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 voting or uh, polling places. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Steitham. Yes, our next question comes from Islip School District Board Member Matthew Clarine. Matthew? Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to um, our school districts and our, uh, our school leaders. Um, so as districts receive their state aid runs based upon the governor's executive proposal, many schools are losing aid through the local district funding adjustment. How will the legislature ensure that this adjustment does not become another gap elimination adjustment with reoccurring withholdings and cuts taking place over a few years should federal funding not be continuous. Uh, and just for context, in our ISIL school district state aid run, this equates to about $2.6 million. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your question. Responses, anyone? Uh, yes, Senator Week. Hi, thank you. That is a great question. And it's a question every school district's been asking. And this year we do see, you know, we have reality and then we have federal funding and, and our schools need to make up this, this portion that's not going to be there next year. We're not going to get that federal funding year after year. Everyone keeps saying that, you know, in the next two years, we're gonna see ourselves falling off a cliff. This is some, it's an opportunity where both sides of, um, of, our, of our party are going to be able to work together to maybe lift restrictions on federal, uh, on uh, reserve funds, um, loosen mandate relief on part 154 regulations, work together to come up with a realistic plan. And this is something I've been talking to my superintendents about. I've met with most of them already. And I said, you know, that's great. We're going to have this federal funding this year to kind of fill in that gap, but we're not going to have it next year in the years uh, to follow. And so we're going to see this big gap and we're going to need to find a way to fill it. So we're, one, we're going to have to fight like hell as representatives to get that money to our school districts. But two, we're going to have to find a way that's realistic. So being able to tap into reserve funds, being able to borrow money from each of those different levels of reserves, not having to pay back interest to ourselves when we borrow it. Remember reserves funds are supposed to be there. They're, those are our rainy day funds. And as everyone keeps saying, it's raining like hell. If you're not looking outside and seeing that, um, I don't know what window you're at looking at, but this is the time to be tapping in and using those funds to make sure that we're able to make sure that our schools can be consistent and move forward in the future. And, you know, like it or not, whether, you, you know, no matter what side of the aisle you're sitting on, if you're representing Long Island, it's going to be our job to team up and fight like hell to make sure that we get our aid to Long Island. Thank you so much. Ms. Malloy? Great, thank you. Okay, question number eight of nine comes from Center Mariches School District. Dr. Ron Macera, Superintendent of Center, Center Mariches School District and President of the Suffolk County School Superintendents Association. Dr. Macera? Okay, oh, I guess you can't see me that well there. I'm uh, got a light background, uh, but thank you all for being here. Um, greatly appreciate it. 
Um, and thank you to the, all the Long Island delegation members. You know, the SCSSA enjoys a, a very a great relationship um, with the Long Island delegation for many years now. Um, you've always been very responsive and we certainly appreciate um, you taking this time, um, especially during the pandemic to do so in this virtual format. Um, uh, especially thank you to the new members um, of the delegation and congratulations. Um, uh, to Senator Palumbo, I, I did expect you'd be wearing a red hat, but I suppose that that, that, that didn't necessarily come, come with the office. Um, and, uh, but, but we appreciate you being here as always. Um, I guess, you know, my question has been answered by a couple of you, um, but, I, you know, so I'm gonna rephrase a little bit. Uh, you know, during times of fiscal stress, um, you know, I think it, it's appropriate to turn towards um, additional flexibilities and mandate relief. And, and several of you have touched on some of those things, things like APPR and Part 154. Um, so Senator Week, I appreciate you addressing that. Um, you know, Senator Mariches, um, you know, we felt the pandemic just like all other districts, um, and it certainly exacerbated many things. Um, and one of the things that exacerbated was the, uh, the equity issues that exist in education. Um, we were a district, we're a district that has a, a 0.71 combined wealth ratio, not, you know, an, a, a low, lower wealth district, uh, seventh lowest in the, in the county. Um, and, you know, we really placed um, equity at the forefront of our thinking. Um, so we took advantage of some of that flexibility. And I, and I wanna thank um, Assemblyman Thiel for sponsoring the legislation um, that allowed us to borrow from our reserves. Um, and I really liked what you, Fred, you said earlier, Fred, about extending that out 10 years and not, not making us pay our uh, interest to ourselves. Um, that, that's a tremendous help to us. Um, you know, we, we used several hundred thousand dollars to purchase Chromebooks to, to uh, attain um, equity for our students so that they would have access. Um, and now we're in a position where we're budgeting every year um, to, to pay that back. Um, certainly it was over five, hopefully now it will be over 10. Um, so I guess my question is, is very quickly, um, do you all support that, um, that change to a 10 year payback and reduction of, uh, and not having to pay the interest? Um, and what other ideas uh, support is there for um, flexibilities and, and mandate relief like um, suspending EPPR for the year and, and taking a look at the part 154 regulations? Thank you, Senator Palumbo. Sure, and, and thank you, Doctor. And um, and I, the hat is somewhere in my room that uh, Senator Laval gave to me um, during the campaign cycle. Um, but yeah, I absolutely would support that. That was a, that was an excellent idea by uh, Assemblyman Thiel. And um, you know, as far as this, and we even discussed it with like the gap elimination adjustment. And you know, we it's it's almost like we're loan sharking. Like we're not supposed to punish our schools to having for having to borrow money. I mean, I can say that as an Italian, you know, that that's that, that it's it's really outrageous that, you know, we put such significant regulations on reserve funds. And as Senator, Senator Weick said, you know, it's it's raining, folks. So I don't know what window you're looking out, but this is this is critical mass. We need to do everything we can to keep our schools running, running and uh, and alive and, and properly funded, um, particularly with the pandemic costs. And I know. I'm speaking with Manorville, you know, they had the issues with, you know, $2 million spent on PPE and they had recovered out of a really struggle, really tough financial situation. And then the pandemic hit just as they were able to exhale. Um, so we need to allow for, you know, at this critical time, piercing the 2% cap. And I know Assemblyman Fitzpatrick's head's about to explode, but, you know, for these purposes and for in, at critical mass, we need to be able to do these things now in the short term, it can't be a long-term thing. It needs to be a sunset situation, in my opinion. So the conservative in me still says we got to keep, you know, our, our costs under control. But at the end of the day, um, we have to support initiatives like this and creative ways to get money in the short term to the schools so they can still survive. But thank you. That's a great question, Doctor. Thank you, Assemblyman Smith. Thank you. I think, um, you know, I joined my colleagues in uh, supporting that. And I think that it is an important thing. I think when we're talking about getting creative, um, I think that, and this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm now the ranking member of the education committee in the assembly ranking Republican. Uh, so something that I've been shouting from the rooftops, and I mentioned this at last year's breakfast, is when we're talking about creative solutions, you know, I know there have been proposals about uh, 
you know, an ultra millionaire's tax and all these things, but something that I think that needs to happen uh, when we're talking about paying your fair share. Uh, the fact is, uh, Long Island makes a significant local contribution in our property taxes. But if you look at New York City, there's no mechanism for New York City, some of the most valuable real estate in the world. Uh, they make no property tax uh, contribution to New York City schools, which, as we well know, are consistently you know, underfunded. But the reality is this, and I, I brought this up to the city schools chancellor at last week's hearing. Um, the fact is, uh, we, you know, again, we talk about uh, how Long Island educates a great number of students and we don't receive that much aid back. But where is that aid going? That aid is going to places like New York City. And even with, and I've said that uh, the people we represent are compassionate, um, we still have to take care of our students here on Long Island. And every dollar that goes to other parts of the state like New York City, away from Suffolk and Nassau County, re results in higher property taxes on us. So I think that it's important. I have legislation in. Uh, and it's something that I, I hope will continue to be a conversation for a 1% property tax on New York City, uh, you know, uh, property uh, across all five boroughs to exclusively fund New York City um, uh, education, New York City schools. And if you look at it, not to put anybody on the spot, but uh, Bill de Blasio, one of his two houses is in Park Slope. It's worth $1.76 million. The last number I saw for his property tax are $4,400 a year. Um, I don't think, you know, on my property, which I've only owned for the last four years, I don't think uh, the people who lived here have paid that since, you know, for a very long time. So again, it's not about uh, punishment. What it's about is equity. And the fact is when New York City um, is talking about how their students are learning in portable classrooms, they don't have the uh, opportunities and technology that our schools have. Uh, they don't make that local contribution that we make. And I think that that's a major mistake. So I think when everybody's shouting about uh, people paying their fair share, I think, you know what, let's talk about creative ways that haven't been discussed. Let's talk about New York City contributing that for New York City schools so that Suffolk County residents that not only pay the highest property taxes, but pay a significant state income tax can get some of our, our money back here. Um, and further, uh, it's just, you know, I think it's important, as you mentioned. Uh, and then the last question, just to just dovetail, because I think Alexis White did a great job on that. Uh, we don't need, um, you know, the gap elimination adjustment took so many years to get rid of. Uh, if you remember, it was phased out in three years. And that was from the budget gap we had back in the 2008 uh, recession. Uh, so uh, the fact is, we don't need that on our backs to be the next thing that we fight on for the next 10 years. You know, that's that would be devastating. So um, I support uh, Assemblyman Thiel and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at creative ideas and I'll keep uh, throwing out ideas and hopefully people will listen to that. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Thiel. Yeah, uh, Ron, when did you go into the federal witness protection program there? So, <laughs> and I, I got your phone call. We'll be, uh, you know, we'll be setting up the meeting with uh, next week with you. And uh, um, you, you know, listen, we put the legislation in last year. It was helpful. It was really suggestions from school superintendents and school business officials uh, uh, about extending the time and eliminating the interest requirement. So, you know, that idea came from you and, you know, we, we've, uh, we've uh, drafted the bill. It's going in next week, looking for bipartisan uh, sponsorship, certainly. So uh, hopefully everybody will, will join on. Uh, the only other thing that I would add is, as I said, the idea for this came from you. So uh, if there are other ideas, you know, that, that, that we can try to pursue legislatively, especially as we careen towards the, uh, the end of the budget process here over the next two months, uh, we're open to them. So if, there, if you have other ideas or other suggestions, uh, you know, the, the, I know you suggested uh, or was suggested at some point about, you know, increasing the percentage of the fund balance that, that you're allowed to, to maintain. That doesn't come to my committee because it's it's exclusively school, so it's education. So maybe maybe Doug can work on on that one. We can all work on it together. Uh, but uh, if you have other ideas about fiscal flexibility, you know we're all ears to try to help. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Giglio. Yes, well, I was going to give all my accolades to Assemblyman Thiel for coming up with this great idea and thinking outside the box. And I'm happy that it came from the school districts and the people that are affected by it the most. I would definitely support the extension of time to pay it back and the waiver of interest. I think paying interest on your own money is a 
a little bit absurd. So I will support the bill for the extension of time and will try and push back on the unfunded mandates that really, uh, you know, legislators in Albany have no idea how those unfunded mandates ex affect the school districts. So we need to keep those in check and I will work with Assemblyman Thiel on these, uh, on these amendments. Great, thank you. Dr. Scytham? Okay, we're coming to an end. Question number nine. <laughs> uh, this comes from the Suffolk Region PTA, Lori Fontana, uh, the Suffolk PTA Region Director. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanna take the opportunity to thank Longwood, um, the entire Longwood School District, uh, Eastern Suffolk BOCES, and our elected officials for being here this morning. So our question is, PTA has long opposed the legalization of marijuana, considering it a gateway drug to stronger illegal substances. It is also felt that the legalization will make marijuana much more accessible to our young adults. With the state facing a severe budget deficit this year and with legalization of cannabis having the potential to raise a lot of money, our state legislators have a difficult decision to make. Where do you stand on this matter? Okay, uh, Assemblyman DeStefano. Uh, okay, so this is like a carryover from last year because I remember this was brought up last year. Um, I, I worked in law enforcement for 27 years before I retired and I will always be against any legalization of any drug to raise revenue to close the budget gap, number one. Number two, you're correct. It is a gateway drug to other things. Uh, we do not, so I do not support anything like that that will put it into the hands of people um, that will misuse it and to be misguided in the idea that this is a good idea is not, in my perception, the right way to go. Uh, one of the things I, I bring out when I talk to people about this, because it is a very, very hot button topic this year because of the budget and the deficit, is that I don't believe that people are going to go to a, a marijuana dispensary to buy marijuana and uh, pay a tax on it when it's very readily handleable in any neighborhood in your communities, wherever they may be. I think the state is, uh, is overestimating what it thinks it's going to raise by having these places open all over the communities. We can just point to so many different ways and so many different states that have legalized it that all of the revenue they thought they were gonna get never materialized. MVAs, fatalities, all kinds of bad things happen when you legalize marijuana. So I will be absolutely opposed to this. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it might show up in the budget, but we're gonna try and do whatever we can to make it a standalone bill so it can be voted on its merits because I think all legislators should be held accountable to how they vote on this. Uh, sticking it in the budget, you're gonna make it a partisan issue. If you take it out of the budget and you make it a standalone bill, everybody will have to stand behind what their belief is regarding this. Thank you. Assemblywoman Giglio. Yeah, going back to what I said before, you know, mental health is a big problem and opioid addiction and sex trafficking and everything else that comes along with drug use is problematic for our youth and for our communities. So I will be pushing also to have this as a standalone bill outside the budget and I will be voting no. And I go back to no farms, no food. And I see all of our farms turning into uh, marijuana growing facilities instead of the food production that it was meant for. And the, the income and the revenue from marijuana will not offset the spending that is going on in the state right now. We need to get away from the pet projects and get away from things until we have a balanced budget and we can operate successfully in the black for a change here in New York. So I will be voting no. I think that if you are going to be looking for money, this is not the place to do it. Thank you. Assemblyman Fitzpatrick. Yeah, I'm very strongly opposed. Uh, you know, we have, we have this desire to legalize marijuana, which by the way, is more potent in terms of its uh, THC content uh, than it's ever been. So it's a much more dangerous substance. We have gambling. Uh, we have a, a malignant tumor in Suffolk County that's right in my district called Jake's 58. 
uh, which is uh, looking to expand another 1,000 by 1,000 video lottery terminals and possibly moving to Medford, Doug, uh, over in your district uh, to expand. And we have Assemblyman Gottfried in the city who would like to legalize sex work uh, and relabel prostitutes as sex workers uh, and uh, <clears throat> tax that activity. So what we're seeing is government pushing out organized crime and taking over these lines of business itself to fund our operations. To me, it is morally reprehensible. It is absolutely wrong for government to encourage these kinds of activities. And none of these activities makes New York State a better place to live. And what you're going to see when the Biden administration starts increasing the federal tax bite uh, on the wealthy uh, in New York, New York becomes an even less competitive place uh, to live work and grow a business. So what you need to do is look at, you know, we're, nobody in government wants to look at the cost side of the equation. You know, I, there was a remark in the chat room that I wanna kill pensions. No, I don't wanna kill pensions. I wanna make pensions more affordable the way the private sector has. We need to tweak the Triborough Amendment so that we can suspend, so that uh, the uh, step increases are suspended when there's no contract to give taxpayers room to breathe instead of seeing the clock continue to tick, driving up their costs and, and thereby their taxes. So we need to look at cost restructuring as well. You know, the revenue raisers, you're not gonna raise the kind of revenue you think you're going to raise. A state like New York, which is already the hot, one of the highest tax states in the country is losing residents and businesses. And when the dust settles at the end of this pandemic, we're gonna see uh, a business climate and a uh, uh, a business climate that is going to be very different than the one we had before this all started. And we're, as far as I can see, we're not willing to take a good hard look uh, at what needs to be changed and adjusted uh, once this new normal uh, is upon us. Thank you so much, Senator Matero. Thank you, thank you, Lori. I am totally, totally opposed to this to marijuana um, legislation that this comes comes uh, forward. Um, you know what, sports betting, I do not have a problem with and with that. But I'm going to tell you right now, pro medical marijuana, I have no problem with. But again, it's it's a huge liability. Look what we were talking about with our children with the mental health. This is just another drug addiction waiting to happen for. For not just for our children, but for um, you know everybody else. So this is something that we do not need to generate revenue through marijuana uh, recreational use. Um, we have we need to do a five state survey and to see what's happening with these five states before we even even bring this forward. Um, what about our law enforcement? What is our law enforcement supposed to be doing right now? They know uh, right now how to handle anything with, um, with uh, uh, alcohol uh, um, abuse, um, with DWIs and all that. Now, what are we gonna be doing with our law enforcement that we have to retrain um, them to, to when someone gets pulled over and how do, how do they go and enforce this? So this is gonna be a huge cost uh, factor, just like what Assemblyman Fitzpatrick just said. So this is something, I know that we have a lot of other speakers. I am totally opposed to uh, anything legalized marijuana. Thank you. Thank you, Senator White. Thank you. Uh, I mean, everyone has brought up some really great points. I can say this briefly, and that is other states have already implemented legalizing marijuana, and you can see the destruction and the havoc it's, it's caused in those states. It did not raise revenue. What it did was allow rehab centers to flourish. And that's where we're seeing exactly what we thought would happen is that it leads to other uses of drugs and it, used, it leads to drug abuse and it doesn't lead to anything positive. Not to mention, and I had a lively conversation over the summertime with somebody who was very much in favor of legalizing marijuana. And I kept an open mind and I listened to them. And one of the things they said, you know, we should be able to, as a freedom, we should be able to smoke marijuana out in public in parks if we want. And to that, I said this, what about all the individuals that we drug test on a regular basis? Our police, uh, truck drivers, you name it. There are plenty of, of occupations that have to be drug tested. If they go to the park and someone's smoking marijuana, they are now going to remember that secondhand smoke will lead to someone getting a high. Um, and so you, you're going to 
inadvertently make children, you know, they're going to now be suffering those consequences as well. So secondhand smoke is an issue that a lot of people are, are kind of putting aside and not addressing. It is a big problem when it comes to legalizing marijuana. So I'm opposed to legalizing marijuana. I, it does not lead to anything positive except medical marijuana. I will say there are lots of people in our community um, especially those individuals uh, from the Dravitz um, syndrome that do benefit greatly. They, they suffer seizures and marijuana, medical marijuana has been uh, very helpful to them. So I will say that medical marijuana, I will, I, I'm in favor of, but legalizing marijuana use is just not a good idea. And in these times, trying to legalize all things that lead to bad things, depression, um, gambling habits, drug use, this is not the time to be using those items to be revenue generators. It's a bad idea. Thank you so much, Senator Boyle. Thank you, and thank you, Lori, for that question. Um, I agree with all my colleagues. Uh, my first year in the Senate was spent as chairperson of the Hope, uh, Heroin and Opioid Task Force, which I asked to have created. Went around the state, we held 18 hearings. So hundreds of people testify, and without a doubt, every single one of them said they started with marijuana. Uh, it is a gateway drug. I've always believed that. Actually, Governor Cuomo believed that for his entire career until recently when he needed tax revenue. Um, I don't think we should do this. You look at, as my colleague said, other states. I would tell everyone to go on YouTube and look at the 60 Minutes uh, segment on California's legalization of marijuana. They talked to people. It didn't create tax revenue. It created a lot of problems. The black market, we're, you know, if they legalize it, when they legalize it, it looks like it's going to happen despite our protests here in New York. The taxes are going to be so high on it, they're still going to be getting it from the, the person in the corner. So we're just going to have the bad and not the good. Um, and our young students are going to be saying, well, if it's legal, I might as well try it. It's not, not can't be that bad, right? And then we have a whole new generation of kids who already have mental health issues uh, suffering from pot potentially uh, addiction. So uh, vehemently opposed to it. And I'll oppose the budget if it's in there. Thank you so much. Assemblyman Thiel. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, I was a freshman at Cornell University. And the first time I saw marijuana was in my dorm and it was in a plastic bag. If you, had I could have never guessed 50 years later, the marijuana was gonna be legal and the plastic bag was gonna be illegal. So, but that's where we are in 2020, 2021. So first of all, this proposal is an important policy proposal. It should not be shoehorned into the budget where we can't make a decision on the merits of this proposal and have to choose among all of the good things that we fight for in our community, they're gonna be in the budget. It shouldn't be in the budget at all. Uh, you know, for me, I, you know, every year I go to Riverhead, I go and, and, and uh, Assemblywoman Giglio goes there too. It's always in May, it's in the spring, we couldn't have it this year, but we have a big march at the Riverhead School where we all get up and make speeches about uh, telling kids how they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't get started on drugs. It would be the height of hypocrisy for me to go make those speeches every year and then vote for this proposal. I, I, I just cannot, and uh, it should not be part of the budget. So I'm opposed. Thank you so much. Okay, I know we have three more hands that are raised. If I could just, add, I wanna get to all of you. Um, however, we don't wanna run out of time. So if you can be brief, that would be great. So we'll start out with um, Senator Palumbo. Probably the last person on this panel that's usually brief. But um, <laughs> <laughs> look, short version, I'm a former narcotics prosecutor. I agree with everything that was said. It shouldn't be in the budget. Um, it will not generate the revenue that is predicted. And, I, and we've seen actually some other internal um, evaluations that have said the same thing. So this is... Um, and just w without repeating everything that, you know, in, in a pandemic to do this now with all the depression and other mental health issues that we have, um, knowing what the, the effects of marijuana can do to the human body, it's just a terrible idea. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Engelbright. Yes, uh, it should not be in the budget. I'm opposed. Oh, that was brief. <laughs> That's the briefest Steve Engelbright has ever been in his entire life, I'm telling you. <laughs> Okay, so the last hand goes to Assemblyman Smith. I can't be that brief because I've known Mrs. Fontana since I was 16. So, uh, no, but uh, no, I think that this needs to be pulled out of the budget. I think it's crazy that this should be in the budget. We have an issue, the fact that it's still illegal on the federal level. Uh, the fact that you actually can't put money in a bank if you are engaging in this type of business. I think that's incredibly problematic. 
And, uh, you know, I was happy in 2014 when we passed a medical marijuana. Uh, my predecessor, Al Graff, for those who remember him coming to these meetings, uh, he protested greatly about the gummy bears and the edibles being included in medical marijuana. And because of his protest, that was actually taken out. Senator Diane Savino, that's that proposed the original bill, saw that taken out. Uh, so that's something I don't think we're going to see that this time around. But the concern that, you know, the gummy bear bag might say eat two gummy bears. If my two and a half year old daughter gets a hold of it, she's going to eat all of them and wind up in the hospital. I think that's a real concern. So this is not something I can support uh, as far as the funding that's proposed on that. Uh, I do hope that this is taken out of the budget. I really doubt it'll be taken out of the budget, but uh, it's not a section of the budget that I can support if it's in there. And I'll end on the fact that, uh, you know, if somebody hands you a cyanide capsule and covers it in chocolate, you still should need it. So I'll be voting no on that section of the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Malloy. Thank you, Dr. Statham. Okay, I just want to take a moment, pause back and go back to Congressman uh, Lee Zeldin's video. I think we're able to run that. Good morning, everyone. I greatly miss having the opportunity to join you all in person as we've done together for so many years. But as we all know, this year has been unlike any other. 2020 was a difficult one for our island, nation and world, and we still face many challenges. I'm confident that with your remarkable leadership and your hard work, our local communities will be able to get through these challenges together. In addition to vaccines being administered, we must ensure that our schools always have the resources that you all need. Last year, the CARES Act created the Education Stabilization Fund, which provides billions in funding to K through 12 schools to assist with the outbreak of coronavirus. Congress has continued to increase funding to schools around the country and here on Long Island as educators transition from virtual to hybrid and in-person learning. One of the things I miss most about this year's breakfast is the opportunity to answer questions in person from some of our community's brightest students. I wish I could have joined you all live today, but as you listen to this message, I'm scheduled to be at Army Reserve duty this weekend. If any of you, any of the students, educators on this call today have any questions, please reach out to my office locally or in Washington. I look forward to hearing from you. And most importantly, I look forward to all of us being together in person again soon. Thank you, Congressman Zeldin for your comments. So I'd like to, before we end, we have a couple of more things to check off. I just wanted to thank all of our elected officials for taking the time today to address the many topics that are affecting our schools. And I'd like to bring into the conversation, President Penelope Blizzard McGrath. Okay. You're on. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Longwood Board of Education, I wanna thank all of you and particularly the students for spending your Saturday morning listening to our elected representatives answer your insightful questions and for your dedication as advocates for public education. You are all so impressive and we, we all know you will continue to be great advocates in the future. I'd also like to thank Eastern Suffolk BOCES and Dr. Julie Lutz for all of their help facilitating this event and for their technology department for the amazing job while I wished we were in person, this was a great way for us to get together under the circumstances of this pandemic. Thank you to Suffolk Region PTAs and New York State Council of School Superintendents. Thank you to our elected representatives for taking the time to speak with all of us today. Clear communication is paramount when facing a difficult budget season, and we appreciate your time spent answering our questions today. We hope for success with your efforts getting Long Island the funds it needs and deserves, as well as the mental health needs and the issues we all have with unfunded mandates and the opioid issues and other issues that were brought up today. Based upon your answers, I do remain hopeful. I'd also like to thank my colleagues from boards, boards of education across Long Island and their districts for attending. 
Thank you to my colleagues on the Longwood Board of Education, Ms. Victoria Malloy and Dr. Rhonda Statham for moderating this, moderating this wonderful event. And thank you to Dr. Lonergan for your endless support of students in our communities. I also have to express our sincere gratitude for one of Longwood's gems, our public relations director, Pam Donovan, who has been the worker bee behind the scenes for, an, for our annual legislative breakfast. Uh, I think this is my ninth. And thank you so much, Pam, for all of your hard work. I know how much this event means to you and our district. And once again, you've done an absolutely incredible job. Thank you all for your continued advocacy during one of the most historically challenging years to serve as a board member. As we continue to weather this storm until the end, let us remember the famous quote, which has become my favorite this year. Life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. So please keep dancing and thank you again for all of your efforts. Thank you very much. Okay, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. And I'm sure everyone will reach out to you. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, you thank you. Great Bye -bye. job, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.